It's episode 62, and the world is in an uproar. Well, we're in bizarre world right now with the dolphins on top of the ladder and the tigers in the eight. Yeah, who <laughs> sure would have thought, eh? Um, Pigs will fly. Yeah, exactly. Um, some great games on the weekend and some terrible games. I watched a lot of them. Um, we can kick off right now with the Panthers-Roosters mm-hmm. game in which... Mm-hmm. Everybody tipped the Roosters, and nobody was right. Yes, that's right. Um, that Panthers juggernaut, eh? No Nathan Cleary, no James Fisher-Harris, and they still get the job done. It's quite extraordinary. Yeah, it was um, It was quite a good game of football, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dylan Edwards seemed to win that battle of the fullbacks. 223 metres, four tackle busts, two try assists, and a try himself. Compared with Tedesco's um, fairly quiet night by his standards, having 129 metres and five tackle busts. So you'd have to say Edwards has got his nose in front with that New South Wales. If Michael Maguire is going to pick it on form alone and not reputation, which he said that he is, you'd have to think Dylan Edwards is in front at this point in that battle. Yeah, well, if you took it off this week's round only after the Dragon Seals game, with the Sea Eagles game we'll get to on Saturday, then definitely Dylan Edwards is the number one. Yeah, Tom Turbo didn't have the best time of it, did he? Um, we will get to that. Um, your Dragons did benefit from that. But I guess in this Roosters... Panthers game, just this issue with the obstruction, um, that, that, that obstruction oh, call... Shocking. Um, um, that went against um, Jared Warrior Hargreaves. Um, it's come to light that Dylan Edwards slightly deviated from his path as well to avoid referee Adam G. Um, so, yeah, we've got this situation again where um, there's an obstruction controversy. Um, what, what I couldn't work out about it was um, Graham Annesley coming out... Um, on Friday, obviously the day after the game, saying that the bunker should have used discretion on whether Edwards would have impacted play since the Roosters didn't take advantage of the gap made by Jared Warrior Hargreaves. How did the bunker not know when they're supposed to use discretion? What is this? You've got bunker officials who look over replays time and time again and seemingly they don't even know the rules. If they don't know the rules, then what hope does anyone else have if, of knowing the rules? Are, you, are they actually allowed to use discretion? I thought they weren't, and I thought well, that if, was the whole thing. Well, that's the thing. If Graham, Graham Annesley's come out and said the bunker should have used discretion because um, the Roosters didn't take advantage of the gap made by Waria Hargreaves. So this is the point, and I, I was watching NRL 360 last night, and... Paul Kent was saying, oh, you know, um, we make the rules black and white and when people aren't happy with that, they say we need to go back to discretion, then we go back to black and white. And then it's like, well, I mean, they've made a black and white ruling here, but they was, according to the NRL head of football, Graham Annesley, they were supposed to use discretion in this instance. It's all very confusing to me. I thought this this looks like one of those things where they decided at the beginning of the year to crack down on it and... For the first like six weeks of the competition they'll crack down on it it'll create a whole bunch of issues and then they'll just forget about it and ignore it for the rest of the competition and my problem with that every year when they decide on one of those things is like that breaks that makes the first few weeks of the year very different to the rest of the year and the teams don't play differently they just get penalized less for exactly the same thing obstruction should be discretion obstruction should be a gray issue because there's so many times where um, you know, like the there was calls over the weekend actually where it was funny. I was messaging in my WhatsApp group and saying, "Well, this is how this is going to turn out," and then it turned out the other way. It, it's just bizarre. Like the the way they're they're doing it right now is just it doesn't make any sense to me, and it doesn't make any sense to anyone that I talk to, uh, anyone that I see watching rugby league. Um, like there are tries being disallowed because opposing players are tackling players off the ball and then they're calling it obstruction. You know, like, it's, 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 you gotta call it what it actually is. Players are in no way, like attacking players are in no way impacting the game. No way impacting the ball, no way impacting the play. Then an opposing player, defending player, is tackling that player 
and calling obstruction, like screaming about an obstruction, when they're making a conscious choice to tackle the player, that any other time, the, any other time that's uh, tackling a player off the ball, you know, that's a penalty to the attacking team. But in these like obstruction rulings, it's a penalty to the defending team. It doesn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. If I make a conscious choice to tackle a player that doesn't have the ball, it's a penalty against me. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what the rest of the ruling is. And then, then me having a whine and going, oh, I was obstructed, I was obstructed. It's like you chose to, ta- and you can t- clearly tell when they choose to tackle them. You know, you can cho- you can tell. You can look at it and go, well, he's made that choice. And then the the immediate like whining about the obstruction, like, well, he's made that choice to exploit the rules. <laughs> and, and that's the ones where you, the referee and the bunker should be able to use discretion and go, no, no, no. He's done that on purpose. He's done it on purpose. That's mm. <laughs> the, you know, I mean, it's it's almost as if the the use of the bunker, the, the multiple looks at replays, you feel like that's perfect. Not only is that preventing common sense from being used, it, it's even preventing that the officials in the bunker from even um, officiating to the rules. It, it, again, the head of football's come out and said they should have used discretion in that instance. They didn't. So looking over those replays over and over again has just got in their head. They're terrified of giving a try when there's some sort of mild semblance that the player might have been in some way impeded with. And it's just confusing for everybody, including the officials themselves. Yeah, it's beyond ridiculous. And they, they, there's an easy way to do it. You know, it's it's it is to be able to use discretion, realistic understanding. Like that's what it's that's the easy way to just go. Like, well, he was never going to make that tackle, <laughs> and so the obstruction is irrelevant. If you have a player, like technically to the letter of the rules, right? If you if you're the players on the right side of the field involving a winger, as far right as you can get, and a player on the left side of the field is obstructed by a player running through the line. Is it, a, is it an obstruction or is it just nothing happened? But right now we don't even know. We have, Nobody knows. Refs don't know, fans don't know, commentators don't know. It could be that like... <laughs> the, the officials don't even know. Yeah. The officials in the bunker don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> and so that's a, like you could have a situation like that where, well, you know, technically to the letter of the rule, the three was obstructed by the opposing four, but the play was on the other side of the field. <laughs> and it's just, it's nonsensical. And it... <clears throat> there was a few close games over the weekend where I think it actually had an effect on the game. Um, and Roosters and Panthers, Roosters and Panthers, I think in the Bulldogs game, it had an effect on the game. Um, in the Dragons game, uh, there was a couple of rulings against the Sea Eagles that kept them out of the game. Uh, and then there was a couple against the Dragons, which was irrelevant because the Dragons made about 300 errors anyway. Um, and it actually in the Eels and the uh, Tigers game yesterday, there was a couple of issues, a couple of times where I was, it was just like, the, and the fact that the game, these, these games I'm talking about are so close, like Panthers versus 22-16, Rabbitohs 20-16, to uh, Dragons 20-12, to and Eels, Tigers Eels 17-16. Those disallowed tries or disallowed um, uh, things and penalties awarded because nobody knows what's going on mm-hmm. have had an actual effect on the outcome of the game, even if it's earlier. It's... You know, normally we've talked about it many times, like, you know, there were 70 other minutes in the game or whatever. But mm. it's happening multiple times throughout games as well. It's breaking mm. the flow of the game and it's making the games. That's what I was saying. Like, the, I opened the thing with, like, uh, some of the games are good. But the mm. reason a lot of the games weren't fantastic were because of these things. That Panthers Roosters game wasn't fantastic because it was they were missing too many players and the Roosters played terribly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think it helps. Graham Annesley coming out and giving his opinion on everything the day after. I think that just adds fuel to the fire. Um, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I, I think they need to abandon the idea of him, you know, having to feeling like he has to justify every decision that gets made. Um, and, and this just comes back to that argument against the technology altogether. Once again, if the technology wasn't in use. We wouldn't be dwelling on this. We no, wouldn't be. This is, 
this is a result of us looking at replays too many times and everybody getting confused about it. If they didn't use the bunker, if they had no bunker, if they just went back to having you know, two in goal judges at either end to help the referee with the, de the decision using the touch judges as well, we wouldn't have time to look at this so many times because the game would keep moving, it would keep flowing, the, the kickoff would be made very quick, you know, the, the kick at goal would be made very quickly and then the kickoff would be made very quickly to resume play. We wouldn't have the time to dwell on this. The use of the bunker, not only is it holding everybody up and, you know, creating too many stoppages in the game, but it's also creating this problem as well that we've got too much time to dwell on these decisions, too much time to look over them over and over again. And it's just doing everybody's head in at the moment. Yeah, and it's, it's beyond ridiculous we, now. Again, you know, they, they, they keep, by using the bunker, they're trying to make the game perfect. Perfection does not exist. It doesn't exist. It can't be done. So they need to abandon this idea that the game can be officiated perfectly. Yeah, and it, it just really, it makes the, these, this, this game on Friday, Thursday, could have been really good, but unfortunately, like instead of talking, well, as I said, the game wasn't that good because the Roosters were terrible and the Panthers were missing troops. Um, but the fact is, it's all about the bunker instead of being about the um, the game. Yeah, that's right. And also, I just wanted to mention, um, I don't know if you caught um, Channel 9's coverage of no, the game, but um, so I, I know everybody makes mistakes and everything, but um, Paul Gallen in commentary. I thought it was Jared Warrior Hargreaves' 300th yeah, game. Yeah, interview when, after the game as well. Like, what? That was last week. It was last week. Like, and it was a massive. On. It was a massive thing last week because Nick Politis even like went on the the camera and stuff like that. Like, was, come on, I know everybody makes mistakes, but seriously, when you do it for a living, sure, surely, surely you got to do better than that. Yeah, that, that's that's that that was like really just ridiculous. Actually, it's it's you know they try to justify it, but there's no way. It's one of those things where it's just like. Well, he looked like an idiot, and it was because it was kind of offensive and stupid. <laughs> like the the podcast Dana White, Joe Rogan. The, yeah, the exactly. It's just, it's just the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Like there's no the... avoiding the embarrassment there. Yeah, you know, yeah. You got to. I, I know. Again, we all make mistakes, but Paul no, Gallon's got to... too big of a mistake. Some yeah. mistakes are acceptable. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's <laughs> acceptable mistakes and non-acceptable mistakes, and that's in the latter category. Mm. Um, moving on to your Bulldogs on Friday, mm. uh, Bulldogs were robbed. Um, absolutely robbed. Look, I, I tipped the Bulldogs, um, but they were robbed. I think that was a shocking, absolutely shocking game of football uh, by the everything about the NRL. Nothing to do with the Rabbitohs and the Bulldogs. I think penalties that should have been awarded that weren't awarded for no reason or went in the way of the Rabbitohs. There were no 50-50 calls. There was a bunch of like 90% calls that went to the 10% towards the Rabbitohs. It was absolutely farcical display. And, you know, you talk about Graham Anderson like coming out and and talking about the Panthers the Roosters game, nobody ever comes out from the NRL or anything like that and says, Wow, that, that was a bad one. Like, you know, Ricky Stewart in the um in his press conference on Sunday gave it to his team. No one ever comes out from the NRL and gives it to the team. It was it was beyond ridiculous. I don't understand how Latrell Mitchell doesn't get in trouble on the field for sliding into Ado Carr's head. It, to me it was exactly like that um uh who was it? Taylor May taking out Reese Walsh. It was exactly the same thing. And they, they kept using the same thing, like accidental, accidental, accident. Accidental is irrelevant. All of them are accidental. He slid with the knees, or was it yeah. hip, yeah, into no. Adokar's head and knocked him unconscious. And in that Taylor May example, it was Taylor May, right? Yeah. Um, in that Reese Walsh example, everyone who was for the penalty was saying it's the duty of the defender to take mm. care of the attacker. And in this... Mm. Uh, example, they kept going. Well, there was nothing the troll could have done to avoid that. There was. He had duty of his de to take. He had the duty of the defender to take care of the mm. attacker. Yeah, that, that, this uh, it was an accident. Argument is just garbage because um, <laughs> very rarely would a player intentionally try to hurt the other player or inflict foul play on the other player. So using the oh, it was an accident defence, it just doesn't stack up. It's about the nature of the offence. It's not about whether it was accidental or not. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's that, that, that that's a flawed argument as well. I don't understand how whichever player it was didn't get penalised for doing a hip drop ta tackle on Preston as well. That was a clear hip drop, ta hip 
drop tackle. Um, and it was funny because I saw footage now on like the internet of Preston actually getting penalised for exactly the same tackle last year. <laughs> so um, there was just multiple, multiple calls that were like incorrect, just wrong, absolutely wrong that went against the Bulldogs. And I, I, honestly, I think they were robbed. Yeah, and I mean, um, Addo Carr was put out of the game with a concussion as a result of that contact from Latrell Mitchell, who was hit with a fine, um, a $2,500 fine, um, a grade one dangerous contact charge. Um, so, yeah, I just thought, um, you know, um, one, one thing I noticed, and I, I, I know I keep banging on about this, but... Um, and, and look, he, he did some good things in attack, Blake Taff. He, he put that kick in for that Connor Tracy try, mm. which was the play of a halfback, really, a fullback stepping in as a halfback, and he um, forced another repeat set later on. So the short kicking game of Blake Taff is very good. But one thing I noticed from him was he kept making this habit of diving at the ground before he got to the defensive line and it gave the defense a, a dominant tackle it makes it really hard for the next person taking a hit up it's hard to get momentum into the set i look back at the statistics blake taff had the slowest average play the ball speed of all the bulldogs players 4.24 seconds i just thought it was too slow and it was putting them on the back foot they weren't getting good kick returns out of him as i said put in those two really good short kicks um, but that, that's you know that's a real issue. Your fullback's got to be a player with, with one of the quickest in the team at playing the ball. Yeah. The, the slow play, the ball allowing the dominant tackle, that was just putting the Bulldogs on the back foot far too often. Um, yeah, he um, also didn't have the best all run meters, so he's tackling. No, he didn't. Well, he had more than Latrell, but um, if, uh, he ran 22 times for 127 metres. Which... And, yeah, and if it was Stephen Crichton from 22 runs at fullback, he would have had 250 metres. Mm. So you, you get double the metres out of Crichton from the same yeah, number from, of runs from at From centre. Again, it's this thing where at the Bulldogs, like I talked about it at um, the Rabbitohs, Latrell and Jack White. Jack White's putting up fullback metres, fullback numbers, and Jack uh, Latrell Mitchell's putting up centre numbers and it's the same here with the Bulldogs Blake Taft 22 runs for 127 Stephen Crichton 15 runs for 151 at centre he's putting up fullback numbers mm -hmm. Jacob Karaz um, the other centre 17 runs for 159 the and oh man Connor Tracy 20 runs for 190 the centres are putting in more work than the fullback uh, at the Bulldogs at the moment uh, I still think the Bulldogs should have won, though. <laughs> yeah, they, they should have. Um, they really should have. But I, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think, yeah, as I said, I think Blake Taff did a better job at halfback than the halfback did, and Drew Hutchison. Yeah. I'd be looking at moving Taff to halfback, and then that way you'd get him out of fullback, you'd get Crichton into fullback, and with that host of outside backs they have, with Bronson Sherry, who still can't even get a gig in the team, um... That's it. That's how I'd be playing it. So I'm not. On one hand, I'm. Well, look, I think I'm just being constructive on Taff. I think he's better. He'd be better at halfback than at fullback. Um, and his short kicking game, I think, showed that as well. Um, I think what they might be trying to do, though, what they are doing well, the Bulldogs, is they have tightened up their defence. They've conceded 71 points in four games. That's 17.75 a game. Last year, they conceded 32.04 points a game. So they're tightening up their defence. Maybe their plan is to get their defence right first because if you get your defence right first, it helps your attack yeah, because absolutely. you can take more risks in attack because you can back your defence to hold the opposition out. If you don't back your defence to hold the opposition out, well, then you can't take as many risks in attack and you just have to hold the ball without taking risks because you're too scared of relying on your defence. Yeah, and they're not conceding many penalties, which I thought was really good as well. Like, they only conceded mm. six penalties to the Rabbitohs, 11. Now, in the first half, I believe, uh, the Rabbitohs didn't make an error or something like that. Or late in the, up, like, late in the first half, they still had, they had a perfect... Um, yeah, yeah, Com rate. completed 100% in the first half, 16 from 16. Yeah. The um, and still, uh, the Bulldogs were, you know, actually the better team. Way better team than mm. the Rabbitohs. And that's sort of like, 
it just seemed like the Rabbitohs, like not because of gambling or anything because of that. It just seemed like the Rabbitohs were getting all of the decisions. If Ricky Stewart wants to complain about how much he gets stuck with the bad refereeing decisions, the Rabbitohs just in that game had nothing to complain about. That was like every game, there was a bunch of calls that were clear, clearly incorrect. Not the, you know, most of all that Latrell Mitchell sliding into Addo Carr. Mm. Um, and that's the thing. It's, the Bulldogs did win the penalty count 11-6, but it's not enough to just look at the penalty count. You have to look at the individual decisions. To, it's about whether the penalties were justified or not. It's, yes. not. it's not about the number of penalties awarded to either team. Too often people are too simplistic with this and go, oh, they won the penalty count 11-6. They must have had the favourable refereeing. No, you've got to look at each individual decision and see if it was justified. Um, and yeah, they had the sim bidding of Curtis Moran, which was the other one in the 50th minute. And I, I can't, I don't understand what constitutes a sim bidding anymore when it comes to something like a hip drop tackle. And, and that was the thing, he was sim bin for that, but Souths made a professional foul um, at another stage of the game. The Bulldogs were in an attacking position, Souths held down too long. Yeah, where, 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 where was the sin bin there? Was, but I don't understand what is constituting a sin bin, especially when it comes to hip drop tackles. Actually, um, yeah, it's 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 bizarre. Like J- Jacob Preston's got hip dropped when he was uh, approaching attacking the attacking line. Like he was he was in the in the ten meters. Yeah, like he was actually going for a try and he got hip dropped and and it wasn't even a penalty. Mm-hmm. And then later on, he got his jaw broken. And no sin bidding for that. That was yeah. I, it, I I honestly think the Bulldogs got robbed. Uh, that's my assessment at the end of the game. I was very frustrated. Um, it wasn't a good game of football. It was two pretty crappy teams playing rugby league. Um, but it still, I just it was really frustrating for me to watch the refs deciding the outcome of the game. So yeah, like I was you know only I tipped the Bulldogs. Everyone in the world tipped the Rabbitohs, but. <laughs> Um, then we had the other game on Friday, which everybody tipped the Cowboys for, and they ended up getting absolutely smashed. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a blip on the radar. You could you could try and say um, the Broncos made them look like the Titans. <laughs> the Cowboys were awful, absolutely awful. This is I turned it off because the game was so terrible, um, and this had nothing to do with the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, it did have a lot to do with that. It had a lot to do with Tristan Saylor. Did a great job filling in there for Reese Walsh at fullback. Um, 198 metres, five tackle busts. Um, so very impressive that you could be missing someone of the calibre of Reese Walsh and have a, a replacement like Tristan Saylor there um, ready to step in. Well, they obviously um, have no problems um, attacking without Reese Walsh. <clears throat> that was the fear for the Broncos. Um, the... The other thing about this game that I thought was really interesting was there was only three penalties conceded each side. Like both teams were really disciplined in their in their defence. Um, and yeah, the, the only reason it was such a bad game of football was because the Cowboys were just so woeful. They were just so terrible. Um, they, they they didn't look like they had any structure in attack. It was like what James Mal- was James Maloney off for the week on holiday? Yeah. <laughs> All of their shape. To use the Greg Alexander word, shape. All of their shape seemed out of shape, like they were running <laughs> squares instead of circles or something. Like it was, it was just bizarre. They were trying to fit the triangle block into the, into the rectangle hole. Um, yeah, all, all of their all of their their attacking plays inside the opposition twenty and things like that. They were just they, it was just woeful. They mm. they didn't look like a team that was at the top of the ladder or or was meant to be at the top of the ladder. Yeah, so just correcting myself, it was actually 192 oh. run metres for Sailor, but, you know, very impressive Absolutely. either way there. Um, so, um, yeah, really good crowd there at Suncorp too, over 45,000 for that Queensland derby. Um, Adam Reynolds, really, really good game um, from him. Two tries, 645 kicking metres. Yeah. Very impressive. The, the Cowboys back three. They, they won't want to be playing against him anytime soon. No. no. He, he just tormented them. Um, yeah. So Ezra Mam scored four tries in his last three games against the Cowboys now too. So 
Um, well, well, well done to the Broncos. Um, not many people would have seen that result coming at all. No, nobody did. Everybody tipped the Cowboys. Um, I only tipped four from eight this week. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, in my tipping comp, in my official expert tips, I think I tipped three. Um, yeah, three. Um, and then we move on to Saturday and the worst... Well, look, the Dragons... So you guys saw this description of it. You'd be pleased with that. No, it, was no the most that ex- it was the most exciting game of the round simply because the both teams coughed up the ball so often that you never knew what was going to happen. <laughs> um, and I think in the opening 20 minutes of the second half, the um, I can actually check the stat. I wrote the stat down. Um, it was 20 minutes into the second half. The Dragons had only gotten to their kick uh, twice. <laughs> 20 minutes into the second half, sorry. Manly had a 70... 20 minutes in, Manly have a 70% completion rate for the second half, and the Dragons had 29%. Mm. They finally completed a set 20 minutes in the second half, and Ben Hunt had his second kick. It was it was a Barry Crocker. Uh, neither team did well. <laughs> like, it was... Tom Trebojevic, that was a really worrying performance. Made four errors, um, repeated drop balls and misplaced passes. That that pass to uh, Hamale Olukowatu, he, he was in front of him. And he yeah, just passed it was him so ball. far in front of him as well. He passed anyway. And a lot of his errors were not like he was getting hit hard and, and somebody was knocking the ball out or something, something like that. There were it, times where he was just running and the ball fell out. <laughs> <laughs> like, but the the whole the thing is you hi- we highlight Tom Trevojevic because he's been on fire all year and we expect more from him. But neither both teams played the exact. Like Tom Trevojevic was just the most the biggest player who played so poorly. They ended up being fifteen errors each. But you, there's another one where you can drill it down to numbers. Go well, they had fifteen errors each. But if you go look at the errors throughout the game. Another comment I saw was like they could make a highlight reel of the errors because, the, but they'd have it'd have to be played to, it'd have to have Benny Hill music behind it because <laughs> they were so ridiculous. Yeah. The errors were things like the player is clearly in front. I'll pass anyway. Uh, I'm just running and the ball falls out of my. Head. <laughs> um, like, but they they just rely so much on Trebojevic, so don't they? To the point that when he has a shocker like that, they they, they don't win. So yeah, they just. It's, uh, <laughs> It was it was an awful awful game of football, but it was an entertaining game of football. Um, so Manly, after they started with two wins in a row, now two losses in a row. You know, uh, are, you, are they are the wheels starting to fall off already for the Sea Eagles? You go through the team stats, the player stats, and you find that only Kyle Flanagan and Francis Molo and Tom Eisenhuth and Jack DeBellin had no errors. <laughs> like four players in the Dragons. Kyle Flanagan had a cracker of a game, by the way. Like it's really clear that. I think Kyle Flanagan has always needed a Ben Hunt type player. Ben Hunt had a great game, and I think it's really clear that Ben Hunt always needed a Kyle Flanagan type player to play outside of each other. To be like, and Jacob Little uh, up the middle for them has been um, really good. Tyrell Sloan had a cracker. So the Dragons' spine was amazing. It's just the errors. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, you would have taken that at the start of the season, mate. Like. Four games, two wins, two losses yeah, for the Dragons. Um, you'd be pretty pleased with where they're sitting, considering where everyone, you know, how everyone thought they were going to go at the start of the year. And they got the Knights this week as well, so hopefully yeah. they can get the two wins in a row. But yeah, well, well done to the Dragons. Um, nobody expected that to happen. So no, no, we go, we go look at the expert tips. Everyone tipped the Sea Eagles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, well, well done to the Dragons. Great effort. Um, um, winning against all odds there. And then we had the definite worst game of the season, the round. Um, <laughs> the tit- Dolphins, Titans. Titans. Dolphins was was uh, drivel. Dolphins getting up thirty to fourteen. Um, Titans led like ten nil or twelve nil in, at the beginning. Uh, Mitchell Pierce actually tipped the Titans. Wasn't that a mistake, Pierce? <laughs> That's dropped him down to second last in our expert tips uh, tipping competition. By the way, he's only beating me now. <laughs> I think it's all right. There's a long way to go um, with that, but um, yeah, Des Hasler at the end of the game, he was filthy. He wasn't happy. He, he was going off his brain at his team. Um, 
trying to get some sort of response out of them, I would have thought. Um, yeah, he just hasn't been given much of an opportunity to um, to go to the market to recruit players. Yeah. Um, and he's going to need time to do that. This is going to be a long rebuild for the club. I think so. And I love the fact that it's April. It was April Fool's Day yesterday. So, of course, all over the internet, I saw Des Hazel's been sacked. <laughs> but no. Um, so that's they've um, conceded 90 points across the three games. So they're going at 30 points a game at the moment. Um, they've also become the first NRL team in 22 years to concede at least 28 points in eight straight games going back to 2023. Yeah, they've only scored three tries this year, yeah. Three or four tries this year. Um, they're up for 18 with four tries so far this year. Like, absolutely ridiculously ridiculous numbers for a professional rugby league team. And the only reason... Um, uh, the, the only bright spark to look to into the future is that surely Des Hazler can build something for them in 2025. <laughs> like, looking at the Titans as a Titans fan, you know, all 37 of the Titans fans, looking at their performances over the last three rounds, there's nothing you can see. You know, like I've been talking about the Dragons, I was happy with the, I was fine with the wooden spoon because I can see something there, but the Titans, they, they there's nothing there. And, and for whatever reason, you seem to, they seem to have difficulty attracting the, the big name players as well. Um, it's a real issue for them. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Do, do they look at for feeders on a million a year? Do, do they have to look at you know at, at letting him go and redirecting their funds towards other players? Because I mean, he, he's you know. But he's not putting up anything. Well, he, he, he's not going to fix all their problems. So that, they need to decide whether that's um, smart spending their salary cap or not. And, and if it's not, well, then they need to look at alternatives. Well, we all know Maybe Des, look to spend money on the spine. We all know Des Hasler's salary cap model. <laughs> spend crap tons of money for two years, then leave a club. And back end all the contracts <laughs> yeah, and then leave the, leave the club. Leave the club, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, mm. But you know that's actually what the Titans need. They need some some kind of success, and there's there's no success in that team right now. You watch their football; it was it was an atrociously bad game of football. And the, how bad the Titans were take it away from how good the Dolphins were. Uh, the Dolphins looked really good this year. I think the reshuffle after round one has done wonders. Um, of course, Wayne Bennett, the master coach was able to make a change on the fly that fixed their round one issue. But, you know, they're sitting at the top of the ladder right now. Yeah, and, you know, f further frustration for the Titans with Fafida coming on at the 25th minute. His first action of the 2024 season played 56 minutes, was placed on report late in the game for an attempted trip as well. So, um, so their superstar best player... Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. I don't think the the judiciary or the match review committee don't seem to go too hard on trips or attempted trips these days. They seem to get away with it with just yeah. a fine. So he should be okay going by their recent history of of just, you know adjudicating on those what an awful on trips. Game of football but, it was though. Like it just it's honestly I feel so bad for the Titans fans right now. They they the, look like in three games like the Tigers have for the past three years. Yeah. And, 32 times Wayne Bennett and Des Hasler have gone head to head, and Bennett's up 21 11 wow. in the head to head. Wow. So there you go. Well, there are bogey coaches. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other game, and uh, on to Sunday, uh, the Warriors, of course, put it over the Knights. There was never any doubt on that. Uh, nobody tipped the Knights uh, to win over in New Zealand. It was a little bit more competitive than I would have thought. Um,. But again, this was actually like not a good game of football. It was actually quite awful. I turned it off after only 20 minutes and then just monitored the scores for the rest of the game. Um, I just thought it was a pretty ordinary, dour uh, game. I'll tell, I'll tell you what was impressive, though. Roger Tuovasa Shek at fullback, he, he had a really good game there. Um, 28 runs for 278 metres, including seven tackle busts. Um, so he was there with um, with Sean's Nickel, Clockstad, and Tane, Tuau, Peaky, both unavailable due to injury. So 
I think Andrew Webster said that when Nickel Clockstad comes back, he'll be he'll be back at full back. Oh, yeah, this is just be. temporary. Yeah. But gee, two of us a check really offers them um, another option there at full back. And given you know, given the nature of the competition, to have that sort of depth in those key positions is is very handy for the Warriors. The actually like a conundrum for the Warriors because Roger Tuivasa Sheck puts up those numbers weekly when he plays fullback. You know, he's I remember when he was here before he went off to Union and he and he had a bunch of like over three hundred metre games at fullback. And Charles Nickel Clockstad is, is phenomenal and has been like served the Warriors really well last year, but moving Roger Tuivasa Sheck back to the centres takes a lot away from a lot away from what you get from Tuivasa Sheck. But then yeah, you can't like what are you going to do with Charles Nickel Clocks today? Basically, they have too many superstar fullbacks right now, the Warriors. <laughs> Sucks to be them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't... What can you say about the Knights? Like, um, they're, they're just travelling exactly as I expected them to. Uh, they're currently sitting 15th with one win, um, three losses. They haven't had a bye yet. Um, yeah, I mean... Ponga had his moments, but he probably didn't have enough involvement overall in the game. And th- this is the issue that they're just that they're they're increasingly like Manly. They're a one man band. If Kalen Ponga doesn't fire, then they don't fire. And yeah. especially with Dom Young having left the club now, the reliance on Kalen Ponga at the back is just you know um, is just huge. Yeah, and I don't think um, Jack Cogger and Tyson Campbell are, are able to get. Caelan Ponga into the game um, because the Knights forwards are not not standing up and look you look through their forward pack and they have some great forwards like um, you know Daniel Safidi, Tyson Frizzell, um, Kai Pierce Paul, Adam Elliott. It's just they're not they they're kind of getting like they kind of look like a, a they have no creativity even in the forwards they have no drive even in the forwards and they're just getting beat up like dominated um they're not playing badly they're just not an exceptional uh team and mm. i think it's going to be a long year for the knights fans honestly um kalen mm. panger kalen panger kalen ponga he was obviously the best knights player on the field but yeah like if you're gonna if he's gonna be the only player you have you need to get him involved more. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, yeah, we didn't expect them to do um, too much this season. There, they're sitting there. There, you know, it's only early days. We're only four games in. Um, they've only got the one win from four, and that was against a severely understrength Melbourne team who were missing their first choice halves in Cameron Munster and Jerome Hughes. Um, so yeah, the signs are not looking good for Newcastle. No, not at um, all. And you know it, it, it's hard to see much changing, really, if we're being brutally honest about it. No, yeah, I, I think it'll be a long, long, long year. Uh, in the other game, my God, so um, frustratingly for Ricky Stewart uh, in the Sharks versus the Raiders, the Sharks were up eighteen nil. Oh, the, the uh, Raiders, Raiders were up, Raiders were up eighteen nil, nil in the twenty third minute, twenty fourth mm. minute. 18 mil mm. and then they ended up losing 36 22 yeah you, you don't want to let an 18 nil lead slip do you how i don't understand 18 how you can get from 18 nil to to losing 36 22 i honestly i don't understand it it doesn't make any sense 18 nil is unassailable mm. the, the, it doesn't matter what time of the game it's in it's too much it's it's just it's not possible. <laughs> it's, mm. it's absolutely terrible. Um, and Ricky Stewart gave it to his team in the um, press conference. Yeah, look, and and so he should have. Um, the Sharks won this game, having had more errors than the Raiders. Had fourteen errors to the Raiders' twelve. Um, so there you go. Um, yeah, um, Cronulla centre Kale Iro did a fine job filling in at centre. Two tackle breaks and one forty-four run metres to go with his second half try. Um, so well done to him. Um, Jack Williams, the Sharks forward, 
really good off the bench, had really good impact. A team high 176 run metres and 26 tackles in just 46 minutes on mm. the field. So very impressive from Jack Williams too. Yeah, and um, Ricky Stewart talked about the Raiders and mentioned that the when the f- starting players are off the field, the people coming onto the field aren't uh, contributing. Um, and that's where the failing is. He didn't mention anyone by name, but, you know, there's only four players on the interchange. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, it's it's really... Like, I just... I can't... I didn't watch any of this game, actually. I only watched the scores, and I've watched the highlights since then. But I cannot... I looked at it and saw 18-0. I went, oh, okay, sweet. Um, uh, in our expert tips, I ticked the Sharks, and I thought it was going to be one I lost. Only... Julie Snook tipped the Raiders this week. Mm. Um, and I just thought, well, okay, cool. Got that one wrong. And then came back, you know, it's, it's one of those ones where I didn't even bother monitoring the score. It was just, oh, game's probably over now, like three hours later. Yeah. <laughs> I should check the score. Surely not. How did they... Absolutely terrible. Um, yeah. Ronaldo Molotalo is hard to stop on his home ground. He's now scored 16 tries in his last 12 games at... Points bet stadium, aka Shark Park, for people who don't know which ground is which, with these sponsors' names. Um, that's after his double in that game. So, mm, no. Well. So the Raiders and the Raiders are two for two, two and two, two and two, and they've got the Eels next week, who are also two and two, um, or well, this week, whatever. And so, it's, you know, Raiders are about to drop out of the eight if they lose to the Eels, and that'll be their first time out of the eight this season. It is only five rounds in, but still, it's not looking good again for Ricky Stewart's men. And on to the last game, yesterday's game. Uh, I, watched the, I watched this game. It was a cracker of a game. Um, I, I refs decided it. Um, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Aiden Caesar, last few minutes field goal mm. was what took it for the West mm. Tigers. Yeah, Clint Gutherson missing that penalty goal attempt. He was never going to hit that. It was way too far out. If they, yeah, I mean, you have to attempt it. Um, but... Yeah, I don't think he was ever going to get it. When they took the penalty goal, I just thought, oh, well, I think the Tigers have got this. I don't think... I mean, Clint Gutherson's a really good... Clint Gutherson is a really good kicker, but I don't think he's good enough kicker to kick it from that far out and that far of an angle. Mm. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you want Jonathan Thurston doing, not Clint Gutherson. Unfortunately, Jonathan Thurston doesn't play for the Eels. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you know, again, if Mitch Mitch Moses may have, have kicked that goal, if yeah. he had have been there. Um... um yeah, I thought, you know, the game from um, from Lachlan Galvin was really good. Ridiculously um, good. He was yeah. an ex Eels player, yeah, and they let him go. There was a well, pass He was an Eels for, fan as a kid. He grew up worshipping the Eels. I think the pass from him from um, for... Uh, there was an offload for him. I think it was for... Was it Buller? Was Buller's it Buller? try, yeah. I thought he had thrown an intercept. That's how slick it was. Like when I looked at, I actually looked at it and he did that offload. I went, ah, crap! <laughs> and then I saw Buller running up the field. I'm like, what's going on here? Mm. And it wasn't until the um, replay that I realised, like that, it it was such a beautiful pass. Mm. It was reminiscent to me of like Andrew Johns passing between two players in State of Origin. That's how good the pass was, and the fact that it was getting tackled at the time, beautifully placed for Buller's Buller's try. Um, yeah, Olam got a double. Um, yeah, great try for Buller there too. Um, yeah, Galvin, those two try assists, great game. Um, yeah, that kick for Olam um, early in the game too to put him in, that was just phenomenal. On a 10-cent piece. Yeah, so well done to him. Um, unfortunately, though, um, placed on report, sent to the Sinbin for that hip drop tackle on Kelmer to Alungi. That was a that was a bad one. So yeah, he he might be looking at time on the sidelines now, unfortunately. But yeah, I guess um, all of a sudden with Jerome Luai coming next year, um, all of a sudden the Tigers have an embarrassment of riches in the halves. Who would have thought? Yeah, I think um, Aiden Caesar is only signed for this year, right? Yeah, so I'd say he'll be the one to make way. Mm. It'll, be, him- it'll be it'll um, be. Obviously, Galvin and Luai in the halves yeah, next year. He was year. off the bench in the first round, and then he started... Uh, sorry, second round, their first game. And then he, then they moved him to starting lineup. And then the other thing about this game that I, I read is Benji Marshall went and played a round of golf before the game. 
talk about. Teams should be working for Benji. <laughs> two wins from three. <laughs> if you can turn the Tigers out of all teams around by not being a full-time coach, I think other coaches need to stand up and pay attention. <laughs> Desi needs to get start going and playing golf before Titans games and stuff, man. <laughs> like, I, unbelievable. It was it was a pretty good game of football, to be honest. Like, it was it was not the best. Uh, you could see like superstars were missing and stuff like that, but it was still a pretty entertaining kind of game, I think. Um, of course, Sivo scored a try as expected. Um, Makati Ravalata was on my uh, multi with him and Sivo, and Ravalata didn't score a try for me, so I screwed that multi up. That guy hasn't scored a try in a few weeks, actually. Um, so yeah, that's that's nine tries in nine games against the yeah. West Tigers for Sivo now. He's always going to score. And Happy Coruscant's got. Happy Coruscant's the former New South Wales hooker. Um, yeah, our team high 44 tackles. Um, his creativity out of dummy harvest. I mean, there were a couple of times I think teams are starting to realise when he's going to dive for the line because um, he got shut down by Parramatta pretty easily every time he jumped out of dummy half to go for a try. Um, so he's going to have to make some adjustments to that, whatever his tell is that's giving it away. Yeah, he was shut down like really easily by the Eels. They were clearly in place to stop him. So, rest of his game was <clears throat> spot on, really great. I think there was a bit of an issue with Clemmer maybe putting off Gutherson too with that late uh, penalty attempt to win the game. So, um, there was vision of Clemmer sort of jumping up in the air um, just as Gutherson was taking that kick at goal. So, it's not running anyway. the union, David Clemmer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it worked. He, he must have put him off. and yeah, um, But anyway, that, yeah. that was picked up on as well. I also saw some media today from Ricky Stewart's Canberra Raiders. A trainer was running past... Maybe it was the Raiders, I can't remember. A trainer was running past someone uh, about to kick a goal. But just, you know... Yeah, like I said, I don't think Gutho was ever going to hit that one. He's not. He's not... Your clutch, perfect. He's a filling goal kicker. He's really good, but he's not gonna. He's not the guy you want. If it comes down to, all right, you've got to make this kick from forty meters out on an angle. It's a lot of pressure for a filling goal kicker yeah. from that far out exactly. to be expected to win the game in that scenario. Exactly. Um, and then the Storm won the bye. Uh, of course they did. So they're sitting at fifth. Got themselves two points. Um, it's good. They're going to have a good game this week against the Broncos, I think. Like that'll be a that'll be a cracker. Um, still no word on Cameron Munster and when or if he'll be back. Um, yeah, and that's the round of football. What a what a great, uh, both great and terrible round. <laughs> four rounds in now. We're yeah. four rounds in. Yeah, Dolphins at the top of the ladder. Panthers mm-hmm. on the rise. Cowboys and Raiders on the drop. Well, Cowboys not really. They lost one. Come on. Um, Dragons staying off the bottom of the ladder. Rabbitohs still entrenched down there, even with their one win. Um, it's interesting time for the rest of the year. On to Rugby League news. We're just going to do a few mm-hmm. news articles because we've got Robbo coming in to discuss cricket yeah, pretty soon. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been some uh, media complaints mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the fans booing Latrell yeah. Mitchell. Yeah, so um, I've just noticed some reports, you know, obviously highlighting this booing now. Um, There seems to be, you can only read between the lines here, but there just seems to be some insinuation being made by these media outlets that this booing may have been possibly racially motivated. Now, now look, um, you've talked about it, John. I mean... Look, the the, 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 the the contact on... I, I was at the game, right? I, admittedly, I did get there 10 minutes late to the game and I did leave five minutes before the end of it. I'll put that out there. So if there was booing of him in that time, I did. I wasn't there at that time, so I didn't see it. The the one time I noticed it was well, when he made that contact on Addo Carr. Now, now, if opposition fans see that contact you've made has put one of their best players out of the game... Um, then I'm sorry, but they, they, they're going to boo in that situation. Mm-hmm. That's that's just what football crowds do. Maybe they were booing because... And what fans do is they'll boo to put pressure on the referee to take action on the tackle. They'll try and 
you know, even when, maybe even times when they shouldn't, they'll try and make out like the contact is a bigger deal than maybe it actually is because they're trying to pressure the officials into doing something about it. But that's just football. That's just what fans at football games do. Okay, so, you know, I, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's yeah, just... Yeah. Uh, and it's- it's not a. Uh, I, I I don't notice any booing of him, to be honest. Like, um, and I mean, I notice booing of actions sometimes that Latrell Mitchell takes on the field, like sliding, he dropping his hip into Adam Carr's head. But it's not an Adam Good situation where every time he touches the ball, he's getting booed by opposition fans. But you know what will happen if they start putting focus on this? It will become like that situation. Fans will boo Latrell Mitchell every time he touches the ball. It will become like an Adam Good situation, actually, because um, Latrell Mitchell does stupid stuff in the game. He does. He does things like drops his hip into Ado, Josh Adokar's head late and knocks him unconscious. And, and he got sing bin the week before yeah. for, for taking James to exactly. out of the Exactly. Like, play. he does stupid stuff in the game that is like, you know, you could call it like grubby or dirty or whatever you want to call it. So he gets booed. But if if it gets out publicly in the media and stuff and they start whining about it and start like insinuating that it's like racist and stuff other teams fans will start booing him because of that and then like in my opinion it does become racially motivated you know and it does become an actual issue but the only thing that will happen is it'll just keep getting worse and worse and worse they had no solution for adam goods you know they tried they had no solution so, I mean, the people's treatment of Adam Goods. They, they, they stupidly tried to tell everybody, hey, everybody stop doing it. That's just going to make it worse. But do these reporters who are writing these articles, do they ever think that, well, maybe people are booing him because um, he commented on a judiciary hearing when he wasn't supposed to and no action was taken against him. Maybe they're booing him because he dropped a bunch of F-bombs in an on-field interview after the game and no action was taken against him. So they feel like he is being given preferential treatment by the NRL and you can overwhelmingly um, come to that conclusion given what's happened in the first part of the season Mm -hmm. here. There's plenty of other reasons um, why fans would be booing him before you get to um, insinuating that this um, is racially motivated. Yeah, maybe fans are booing him because he dropped his hip into Josh Adokar's head and knocked him unconscious and took him out of the game. Yeah. so Maybe I, that's why. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> but if you take one of the star players out of the game, um, the opposition fans are going to boo you yeah. in that scenario. That's just football. Maybe maybe the fans are booing the fact that the ref didn't give a penalty for it or, or sin being Latron Mitchell or sanction Latron Mitchell or sanction the Rabbitohs in that game, irrespective or respective, I don't know, regardless of whether it's Latron Mitchell or not. Because that's what you've really got to look at. Not whether they're booing Latron Mitchell. It's whether they're booing what is happening on the field. See, when they were booing Adam Goods, they were booing Adam Goods. Didn't matter what Adam Goods did, when he was, whether he did a good play or anything like that. Opposition fans were booing him to target Adam Goods. Like I said, I, like I, I haven't seen, I haven't been to any game Rabbitohs games this year. But you said you went to the Rabbitohs yeah. games the, like, again. I wasn't there for the whole game, but from what I noticed, it was only when he, um, when the contact he made on Ado Car took Ado Car out not, of the game. They're not booing him. You can hear boos on the television. They're not booing him every time he touches the ball. If the media is going to, like I say, if the media is going to make a issue of it, that's what they're going to do. And Fans that's the thing. They'll and, jump on board. And, and that's the thing. No other Indigenous players were were booed. Yeah. Um, the booing is not of any other Indigenous players. If if other Indigenous players were being booed as well, well, then you could start to make that argument. But that's not happening. No. He's the only one being booed. So perhaps it's not racially motivated. No, not everything is racially motivated. <laughs> no. um, and then uh, Phil Rothfield has um, yes. done an article about the Bulldogs mm. um, yes. and their recruitment. Mm. This is going to come up until the Bulldogs start winning. Yeah, I mean, you know, and look, Phil Rothfield made some valid points in that article. He said... They've spent almost $2 million on utility players. Drew Hutchison, Kurt Mann, Jake Turpin, Jamin Salmon, Blake Tup, Connor Tracy. Um, but they haven't signed a halfback of note. They, they went after Mitchell Moses and Sean Johnson, but both rejected the club's advances. 
Um, they had 42 tackles in the South's 20 metre zone compared to the 18 South's had. So they just weren't maximising their opportunities in attack. They had 57% of possession as well in that game. Um, to me, the, the issue is that... Look, the reality is that the Channel 9 media, which obviously it's one of two TV broadcast partners of the NRL and one of the two major newspapers in Sydney, that they won't hold Phil Gould accountable because he's in their stable. They give him a free pass and he's not held to account enough. And he needs to be. He's been there long enough now. He's had long enough... Again, this is his roster now. All the players who were there when he got there in 2021 have now been removed from the roster. This is his roster, and he needs to be held accountable. Um, You know, again, as you just said, until they start winning games consistently, this is going to continue to come up as it should. They've won one game so far. Yeah, one game, yeah. Uh, yes. In four rounds. Mm. They haven't had a bye, right? No, no. They haven't had a bye. And they got the Roosters this week. Good luck with yeah, that. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Roosters coming off a loss. Mm. Jeez. Oh. Um, you know, we discussed it at length last year and, and at the beginning of this year and stuff like that. There's no expectation for them to make the eight, uh, especially with the roster they have. But I think the major problem that people are going to have every week is... There's, even though it's week to week and it's early days and so on and so forth, there's, there's been no improvement. So the expectation, like I can't remember what you had them in your aid, I could go look it up, but the expectation from everybody, not just Bulldogs fans, is for there to be an improvement in the Bulldogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to be taken week to week. There has been no improvement. Um, at yeah. this point of the year, mm-hmm. last year they'd won two. Um, yeah, two in a row. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they're they're in a worse off position than they were last year. And even if they finish higher on the ladder, because there's some shocking teams this year. You know, like last year there was only three teams pushing for the bottom, the wooden spoon. This year there's like four, <laughs> or even five. Yeah, let's say five. Titans, Rabbitohs, Knights, Bulldogs, Dragons are all pushing for the bottom. Even if the Bulldogs finish higher than all of those, like finishing highest of the bad bunch. Unless you see more gains won, more potential for improvement, it's not going to be anything, actually. Yeah, I mentioned before, their, their defence is getting better. They're conceding you know, close to 18 points a game. Last year it was 32 points a game they conceded. But their attack is not... Their attack's gone backwards. Um, I think I had the... Sorry, I had the average points there. I'll just quickly pull that up. I think it is... Um, yeah, sorry, they're averaging 15 points a game in attack. Last year, they averaged 18 a game. Hmm. So their attack's gone backwards. So at this point last year, they were 10th on the ladder with two wins and two losses. And so, and like even in that at that time, in the, in when they were 10th on the ladder, two wins, two losses, they didn't look like they were going well, and everybody expected them to to drop down a lot. Hmm. But the the this year, the expectation was you would see some improvement. And they, like I said, they don't look like they've improved. They don't look like they're going to end up any better. They're already worse. And it's, you know, it's four rounds in, whatever, blah, blah. You can say that as much as you want. But when your team is that bad, it's a, it is a week-to-week prospect. And unless the Bulldogs, what did they win last year? Seven games, right? Seven games. Mm. Unless they win ten games this year. It's gonna it's gonna be a massive failure, mm. um, and when you look at their team on paper, they've got one of the best back lines in the NRL, and then nothing else. Mm. Nothing else. So where is the where does the improvement come from? Mm. Unless, and you know, if they can't recruit a halfback, well, that's on the the, the general manager of football. Mm. You know, that's he, his job is recruitment. I don't I don't know which halfbacks are off contract at the end of this year or which which five eights are off contract at the end of this year. The only player that I know of that's like looking for a new club right now, as of like right now, we'll, we'll hear about it next week is Zach Lomax, which is useless to the Bulldogs. You know, he's he's a he's a back, so mm. uh, apparently he's going to mm. go to the Eels. But there's no one even mid-season that they could sign 
that that will. That's the thing, and that and that's the thing. Some all right. So if recruitment's not going your way, well, maybe you need to use who you've got better and smarter by putting Blake Taff at halfback, moving Crichton into fullback. Yeah, you're you're better maximising your talent than what you are at the moment. They have someone else, right? That can play halves. That's. So they Hutchison, have, Toby yeah. Sexton. Se- Sexton, right? Yeah. 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 So their halves aren't working. Their back line, their killer back line that's one of the best back lines in the competition isn't working. Um, they, they need a, a shuffle now. Uh, teams will be named today. Yeah, today. It's Tuesday. Mm, yes. Oh, Tuesday. Yes. Happy Easter, everyone. I hope everyone had a good long weekend. Yes. Um, teams will be named today. And I think if you don't see any change now, like, you know, basically this week. Like, you know, you, the Bulldogs aren't going to make the eight. There's no way they're making the eight. Okay, they don't have a, a Kalen Ponga to, to win them ten games in a row. They're not going to make the eight. But if they don't if they don't make a change now, it's just going to leave them at a worse off position probably by the end of the year and then what? Like, then where do you go from there? Um, uh, as I always say, I, I give this Cameron Serrata's first real year in charge. But he doesn't have the troops, the players, to, to make a massive dent. His main goal needs to be to get off the bottom of the ladder and move to that middle tier that, that has no chance of making the eight, but it looks like to the fans that, you know, maybe next year they'll be able to do something. They don't have any big-name signings that they've signed for 2025 either, you know, like a Jerome Luai that's coming to their club or anything like that. Um, He's another one they missed out on. Yeah, they, they don't have anything. anything. Bulldogs, right, Bulldogs fans right now don't have anything to look forward to in 2024 based on the current quality of football being played they don't have anything to look forward for in 2025 based on what the expectation is for players to come so what have Bulldogs fans got right now not a lot yeah. <laughs> not a lot like if I think if they made that change crying to fullback where the tape goes to tape Taff goes to the halves or is just dropped all together or moved to the wing or whatever but Crichton to fullback and there were some issues over the next couple of weeks. I think that would even be an alleviator to Bulldogs fans. You know, you would go as, I don't know, you could speak to it, but as a Bulldogs fan, you'd go, all right, at least they're trying something. Mm. But at the moment, all it looks like is they made the decision, they're going to stick to it even if it doesn't work. <laughs> and that's not a good way to be. Yeah, it's, it's Phil Gould um, caring more about being proved right than than actually um, admitting when he might have made a mistake and, and, and making the change that needs to be made for the greater good of the team. Look, if the Bulldogs can beat the Roosters, that gives um, Bulldogs another Bulldogs fans a week of bliss. It's like the Tigers beating... Who did the Tigers beat last week? Was it the Sharks? Yeah, they beat the Sharks yeah. last week. Mm. It gives you that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and then if they beat whoever they got after that, then it gives you what the Tigers fans are feeling now. But the fact that they're talking like that, like... The Bulldogs fans have the potential to feel what the Tigers fans are feeling is is not really good. It's not really good. It doesn't look good. Yeah, and the, the odd win here or there, I mean, you know, it doesn't change the overall picture until they improve in these in these key positions um, uh, by um, firstly um, um, putting the right players in those positions with the team they've got now. And secondly, by recruiting players where they have the gaps. Um, well, until those, those two things happen, um, this is just going to continue and we'll yeah. get another season where they only win seven or eight games. Yeah, they've got to win ten. That's the thing. They've got to win ten. Uh, if they don't win ten, then I, I don't know what happens because, you know, who knows. Well, one win from four. So at that rate, they get one win every four games. They're only going to win 24 six. games of the season, they'll win six for the year. Yeah. Yeah. Which will be worse. All right. Well, we're going to take a break now um, while we get ready for Gavin Robertson to join us. Um, and we'll see everybody in a minute. See you shortly. Okay. And so we're back. We just did a um, rugby league segment um, for about an hour. And then we mm. took a break. And so Dan's moved over to the other side of the <laughs> table now. And we've got Gavin Robertson here on the Smart B Sports Update podcast. For, I think episode 62. We're just continuing on. So welcome, Gavin. It's great to be here on a, what would you call it? Just an okay day out there. <laughs> it's <laughs> At least just it's not okay. Hot, right? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> not, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it was so hot yesterday. Was it yesterday? Or Sunday. It was so hot. Mm. Now I'm just happy that it's not hot because 
I'm kind of sick of the heat now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, it could be worse. You could be in India understanding what it can oh. like. In Chennai, all of a sudden, um, get ready for today. It's only 44 degrees. <laughs> and it's only 86% humidity. Good luck today. And we're paying you good coins, so we'd like you to do your best. Yeah. Well, you can get paid millions of dollars for going there. Beautiful right? framework of life. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been to India, actually. Um, but I've been to... See, I was at Singapore early last year, and I couldn't. Yeah. Like my daughter, she's how old is she? Eight years old. She couldn't handle the heat. Mm. She just couldn't at all. Well, the, today's very different. You know, the, the cricketer, for example, in India is very well protected, and the the whole system's better. The grounds, the the change rooms, everything's magnificent. Mm. But uh, if you go back in the nineties, a very different <laughs> world. So, I, I I mean, it's impossible to explain. So, and plus, you were so desperate to play, your chances of all right. John or Daniel, you're not feeling well. Um, you need a break. Well, those days were not apparent in the 90s because if you went off, you've got two, three, slash five players waiting to get into the next test team. So you just would not. Yeah, no matter what. No. <laughs> and I've done every stupid possible thing you could imagine on that field to stay on that field because if you're not naturally, if you're an Aussie kid going there and not used to the food, all of a sudden, you're finding that their their most mild curry is ripping you in half. And guess what that does to you when you're bowling your 29th over in 44 degrees of 86% humidity. Um, you're not feeling well on this end, mm. and you're also not feeling well on the other end. Mm. And that does incredible things uh, mid-overs when you can't go off field to your whites, because all of a sudden your whites change colour. Yeah. It's very <laughs> difficult. So Warney had the right idea, taking the baked beans over to India. Yeah, yeah. I never forget seeing that. We saw the truck bring in the pallet, <laughs> yeah. and I thought, oh my goodness, we can comfortably have toast, pile the cheese on with the baked beans, and because the doctor told us baked beans is very good for you. So yeah. all of a sudden, um, and quietly, I know it's 2024, and we can now say that we not only had a truck carrying baked beans around on a full pallet the other pallet was filled with 4x beer <laughs> <laughs> they were a very very dedicated team we were <laughs> well in so that was the 90s that was 1994 and 1998 but okay. the the, the mm. baked beans one with warney was 1998 yeah, yeah. and the and beer wasn't played. super popular in the 90s in india yeah no and uh, no and and uh, pakistan also used to do the same thing so yeah it's interesting how the world's changed yeah, now Kingfisher is like such a massive beer in India. Oh, yeah. And Kingfisher's yeah. all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's a very good beer, just to be honest, on the slide. <laughs> but, yeah, it's... it's yeah. Well, well Brett Lee's been heavily talking me into his Sydney beer company, and he loves it. What's, what's his beer company? Sydney Beer Company. Oh, is that? Oh, okay. Yeah. And Six and Out is now back together. So here we are mm. rocking away in <laughs> Melbourne, yeah. Adelaide, Sydney three times, and... and uh, because I was a couple of years ago, I got a little bit crook, so I've, I'm probably not as good a drinker as the other boys. So <laughs> I, I had I had half a beer, and on stage we went. You do you do lose the drinking ability. Yeah, you do. <laughs> we're not drinking. Actually, we uh, one of our staff members, yeah, she was very excited you were coming. Unfortunately, he's not here. Um, because he was like, when are they? When are they performing again? So when are you performing again? Yeah, we're we're back soon. Um, we're just trying to work out. Brett's in the IPL at the moment, so. Uh, Brad McNamara is pretty busy with rugby league at the moment with Fox. So we've got a few things going on. But um, in this period, uh, the True Sports group will take over a bit. Yep. So that's really me, Eric Growth, uh, Senior, yep. and Mark Spud Carroll, uh, Richard Chiqui on lead vocals, and uh, Rick Grossman from... Uh, obviously today, the last 30 years, he's been with the Hoodoo Gurus, but before that he was with the Divinals and yep. then Matt Finish. So we're, awesome. we're pretty lucky, but uh, we do love music. And the other thing about it is a lot of sports lovers don't realise they only see the sports person on the field. And they don't realise that sports person's chance of breaking away from the pressure at lunch or the break or halftime is often chilling. Music's always going, especially in cricket. Yeah. Had a lot to do with, you know, how you coped and... It sounds a little bit weird, but it did no, play no, its role. No, no, I totally get it. That's one of the... Because I, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competitively, and a lot of the... It's very intense because it's a one-on-one -on -one match, you know, uh, when you're about to fight. And then you'll see a lot of the people that I know that are high-level competitors that are just headphones on listening yeah. to music. So we, it's more to block out the rest of the thing. And then afterwards, they have their... 
I finished now my my yeah. fight. Now I've got my music that I have to listen to again, which yeah. is different. Yeah, and we live in a democracy, and I think it's great that people love sport. That's the first most mm. primary thing. I love the fact that people grow up together with mum, dad, two kids in a blanket. We're watching this, we're watching that day, but they're sharing. But the other thing off the back of sharing and loving it is you get an opinion. And mm. I think it's opinions that we still allow it heavily in this country. And, and it's magnificent because yeah. it's great to, then it's a great discussion over dinner or, you know, having a barbecue or whatever. And as long as we don't delete that and become some of these other different countries. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was going to just sort of start off by um, just talking to you about the um, the test summer just gone um, in Australia. Um, of course, Australia beating Pakistan 3-0 in that test series. A one-all draw with the West Indies with Shamar Joseph really, you know, coming good for the West Indies. Yeah. And, yeah, just Australia very recently beating New Zealand 2-0 in New Zealand. Um, mm. Just going to get your general thoughts on that as a test summer well, to start off. Uh, well, it's and for the the person sitting at home wondering, you know, where are we or how are we going as a test nation? I mean, yes, we're going good, but there, there is a concern for me that, you know, there's at least I think four to six that are within the next two and four years are going to be heading to, you know, what am I going to do? Do I do I start up a company or do, do I head to Centrelink? It's a new life. Do mm. I? constantly become mum and dad and mum's working and now I'm looking after the kids now I'm finished career because mm. we're approaching that age we've got numerous players that are getting close so yes we're doing well but what are we going to do with that plan if you look at the Pakistan test series I thought it was a magnificent series now a lot of people bagged Pakistan West Indies coming out back in um, August and September I was getting numerous in information from people's thoughts um, off the back of the previous time both countries came out, I thought both countries delivered magnificent cricket for not so much for the game itself, mm. but for the public. You know, the I'm going to get up today, I'm going to go and watch. And, and they were great contests. And I think in the end, look, I'm always happy about our, our country winning, but <laughs> I'm searching for the love of the game as a contest. And it's interesting yeah. that yeah. we as humans today, we're sort of in this very perfect world we you've got to be nice and but it's almost like we're moving away from having contests yeah mm. i hope we don't forget that contests are much to do in our lives of of keeping our lives interesting and us getting up next day being interested so mm. yeah yeah i i thought um it may be different for you as a former australian test cricketer but as as a viewer i I've got to be honest. I, I, I love that the West Indies won that Test match. I thought it was. Yeah. Great. I thought it um, it brought the summer to life for mine. Um, I, I love Shamar Joseph's effort um, in that Test match. Um, yeah, it just really it just really got me in the West Indies playing so well the first time they've won a Test match out here for decades. Well, it reminds you of the time when they became when Clive Lloyd said, "I've had enough." And off the back of, I can still hear my dad talking about, and for the young people listening, they'll be going, well, what happened to the West Indies? What went wrong? You know, yeah. And they were completely deleted by Australia in the late 60s, but very much in the early 70s, 70 to 75, 76. And then all of a sudden, you know, Clive Lloyd, I take my hat off, and Viv Richards, but he said no, and we're changing our attitude. And for anyone interested in how their team is going, read about this because... If you want your team to change attitude, it's how the West Indies did it. And winning is grinning, and I think it's about attitude. It's not about talent. So, and they were they were they were frightening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you can't even use that really rude word before it. But many of us were very very worried and frightened to play against them. They they attacked you both with on the field. Uh, they were brilliant fielders. They bowled extremely quick. They bowled. They were the days where young people today can only bowl one bouncer and over, let alone sometimes two. They could bowl three bouncers and over at you. That meant you only had three balls per over to score off. Otherwise, you're protecting yourself. So a lot of this, and they weren't nice about it. They wanted to win. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and, and as a batsman, I mean, you knew that what they were trying to do, either get you out or you were going to get hit. So, look... But it was a. I, I think that um, as we uh, we're not far from approaching Anzac Day, and I got to do a bit of stuff on that. And what I've learned over the last fifteen years is, we can get worried in sport or scared or whatever, and 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 stressed, but we don't understand the stress of life once you get to speak to 
Anzacs who have yeah. been to war yeah. and what what happened in their life to their wife to their children to themselves mentally so you don't re- so I, I uh, once I learned a lot about that uh, and now passing that on to sports people they uh, they're learning to assess their sporting game as a great opportunity it's fun let's go for it they start to imagine imagine if we can win mm-hmm. and then they learn to not give up and so there's a lot of stuff that we get out of it now and I think that um, looking at the West Indies I thought is this the is this the series here in Australia where they remind themselves, could we be like what we were in the 70s and 80s and the 90s? And they yeah. were frightening. So I do hope that happens. Um, I think that Pakistan, I have felt very much for Pakistan over a long time. Having been to Pakistan in 1994 and 1998, look, it's a, it is a beautiful country, but it can be difficult. Mm. So... I feel for their players and the fact that they've not been able to play within their country for many, many years yeah. after 9-11. Um, mm. so, uh, but I do think it's a nation that can be brilliant at the game. Yeah, so they, they were hosting the Asia Cup, I believe, last year and then India refused to cross over into the borders to play and so all of the mo- matches got moved out of Pakistan. They were meant to host. I think that was it. And um, you know, the only thing I say to that is... When I first went to India in 1985, I very much felt for Indian people because I'd read a lot about the history and what England, sorry about that, what England did to India for a long period of time. And and it really got me going. Before I travelled to India for the 1985 Australian Under-19s tour, um, I watched um, and read about Gandhi. And I can understand that Indians had to endure a difficult pathway because they were theoretically owned by England Mm. but now I think it's time because I see India as probably the largest country in the world that just does so much India run cricket for example but here's my point so now's the time to teach your young people to keep growing your game but remind yourselves not to become like England were in the 30s 40s 50s and 60s and be a great country that spreads and, and allows all in and all to go and travel. Because uh, if they lock themselves down like they do with Pakistan and create, continue that war, then there's no love, there's no caring or sharing within that. Mm -hmm. So prove and show us what you learnt from England. Now you're outright India. So be, be great. And I think that that's important to cricket itself, let alone Pakistan cricket. I think uh, Pakistan cricket's very important to the game, so. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I was just going to share with you um, the thoughts of another former Australian spinner, um, Kerry O'Keefe, throughout the summer. He's a very entertaining commentator, um, one of the best around. Um, he um, made it quite clear that he was getting a bit sick of what he saw as the excessive coverage of the NRL over the summer. <laughs> Do you, uh, okay, obviously as a cricket traditionalist himself, um, do you sort of share his concerns? Do you feel like the NRL is getting too much coverage, stealing too much of cricket's thunder over the summer at the I, moment? I, I think it. what's happened is AFL and uh, Rugby League have become the prominent sports because what's happened with cricket is most of the public are confused. They're yes. confused. They've lost their state cricket love. They don't know where they're playing or when they're playing. Then they don't know where their favourite players are committed to. Are they a Victorian? Are they a South Australian, Western Australian, Queensland, New South Wales, Tassie, etc.? You wouldn't know, would you? Or are they committed to yeah. the Caribbean League? Or are they signed for a, a two-thirds period in the England 100 League? And then they're off to the IPL, but then they're only playing... A, you know, the commitment level has changed in cricket. It's affecting the public. Yeah. So we've got to be very careful of that. Skull, Kerry O'Keefe, he's obviously... He's very correct. And I think it's important that... The NRL, because I know the AFL pushes not to become too overloading. What one of the great learnings I found was reading about the NFL in America. So you've got baseball mm. and you've got basketball, hundreds of games, and it just it, it it's it it envelopes the person's life, let alone the family's life. But what the NFL do is they you know let's say they've got their 18 game season. Well, the entire country yearns towards those 18 games. So, yes, those 18 weeks are very busy. But from from Monday to Wednesday, all of the families are talking about 
their win yeah. or their loss. And it's not just at home. It's within their community. Then, come Thursday morning, they're at breakfast or on their way to work. They start talking about their next possibility in the NFL. They can win this weekend. We're playing such and such. It doesn't just happen in the NFL. It happens in university football over there and high school. And that's the structure. Again, it's not hundreds of games. But what happens is smaller games defines a family to understanding exactly what's going on and can stay with it. So that's cricket's issue. And if the rugby league and AFL try to envelope the 12 months, that could be dangerous. You know, it's like the, the rugby league season from when I was growing up has what, grown by seven weeks or eight weeks, I think. Yeah. So it's definitely spread out. So we've got to be a little bit careful of that. And, and, don't, and cricket needs to understand, let's find a way of getting our public back the 40 year old to 85 year old interested in where our team their their teams are what they're doing where they're playing how they're going because that fills their summer and they get towards we used to always find march 15 was the sheffield shield final all of the australian uh test matches in one day as it finished t20s etc and then bang winter sport came and i think it's important for Mm. how the country or the person at home and the families, how they function. So it's interesting to think how we do that. You you sort of look at, you look at the NRL and the AFL and the the context of the season is very clear. You've got a regular season, then you've got finals, and then you've got a grand final and a premiership winner. That's right. You look at the tennis calendar, for example, you've got four grand slams. Everybody knows the score. Yeah. But cricket seems to lack that real clear context, doesn't it? It It does. It's it's just a bit all over the place at the moment. and I maybe it's, it's probably time to say I probably said it earlier. With I, I think the ICC doesn't run cricket anymore. I believe India does. Yeah. I know India love the game so much, but make sure you are helping the world keep its cricket structure, because then, I mean, what happens if because it's falling down here in Australia? What happens if it start because it's falling down in West Indies? What if it continues? What if Pakistan starts to slide down, which it has been? What if it just becomes just India Ugh. in 10 years' time or 15 years or 20 years. Won't that be a regret? So keep, uh, from India's perspective, c- keep growing the world game. Yeah. Do Not you- only just for national national games, but for their state games because they've got to build their product and they build them through the youth, you know, the 6 to 15-year-old, the 15 to 25-year-old graduating into the professional game and onwards. So... I hope we get that right. Do you think in Australia in particular, it's like the media has a lot to do with the like lack of interest in cricket, not just because it's too confusing to report on? Because the whole thing about Kerry O'Keefe was we had the Pakistan-Australia tests on, but the majority of news media was reporting on, um, who was it, Raymond Fatala Mariner? Aiden Fanua Blake. Aiden Fanua wanting to leave the Warriors. Mm. Uh, that was it, yeah. That, and that was what Kerry was, was following up about. It was so big in the, the Daily Telegraph, the Herald, on all of the news sites. Like, that was the headline. Yeah. Adam Fanua Blake wants out of the Warriors. But over here we have the cricket on, guys. Well, I think AFL has been doing that for a long time. They've still been re- pretty solid with their cricket, um, I must admit. But NRL's really following the NRL program, I think, of, of media volume. Mm. The other thing about it is... Um, it's interesting when you say that because, I mean, can cricket build its way back? That's the question. That's, that's the thing. You sort of, and you said before you didn't want us to hold back. So I, I was just thinking, like 20 or 25 years ago, you felt like cricket was the number one sport in Australia. And yeah. now, in all honesty, you feel like it's number three. Well, here's your point. You just brought up the media. So how in God's name can New South Wales go to Western Australia we're playing at the Wacker. For the young people who don't know, it was a very bouncy, difficult wicket. And how do we get defeated? So we went three days early, mind you, to get used to the wickets. We get defeated in one day, five hours and ten minutes. <laughs> so the, And then we've got to I mean, all of a sudden change flights and fly back home. We fly back home and land at Sydney Airport to see the... the um, I think it was the Daily Telegraph then, or Mirror. But the the back page of your newspaper, sorry, the front page Mm. of your newspaper was New South Wales cricket team. All of our faces were on a gravestone with our scores underneath and the worst loss in the history of Sheffield Shield cricket. 
So my grandmother, who obviously loved Buddy Holly, and my mother was a bandstand dancer, my grandmother immediately calls my mother crying, thinking the New South Wales team has gone down in a plane oh. <laughs> like, no. Buddy, oh, wow. like Buddy Holly. Wow. No. God rest his soul. Yeah. But the point is, it's, that's for anyone wondering what cricket was like then. And we, we covered, that was three pages we covered of that paper, and then we covered it for the next three days. And the thing about it is, is that probably wouldn't happen today. No, and that's the Sheffield Shield. Like, mm. that's now, I, w- I wouldn't even be able to tell you when the Sheffield Shield starts. No. Even what teams are in it, what players play in it, nothing. I could, I, honestly, I could tell you nothing about the Sheffield Shield, except yeah. that the, that's the name of the competition. And, and, and even when I was a kid, in the Sheffield Shield, you'd get, like, small periods at the start of the season where you'd have the War Brothers and yeah. Glenn McGrath, Brett Lee... Yeah. Um, playing for New South Wales, Shane Warner be playing for Victoria, Ricky Ponting will be playing for Tasmania. Yeah. But now you, you don't even get that. Now there's no. no there's no little window where the superstars are, are playing. Sheffield and, Sheffield. and I think when with players travelling all over the the world, the public's routine and interest and love, how how can they follow? Yeah. But that like all of us, they yeah. don't know who's where and and what. And we've, you know, I think that cricket needs to very much get to the the boardroom and and. And get smart, B. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gets, because how if you're selling a product, if you're yearning for that product to be sold, you, the primary thing about that product is for the person to have interest. I'm interested in that product. Yeah. I'm going to buy that product. Uh, like a lot to do with sport, I found, because I, I, I'm historically as a youth, you know, so when I started, I was eight years old, I started following Laura Steelers, you know. Um, yeah. And then now I'm a Dragons fan. I follow Australian cricket only. Um, I love, like, Glenn Maxwell is my favourite player. and things. Yeah. So what, when I'm trying to introduce people to sports, what I kind of tend to do is introduce them to the players of the sport. Yep. It the, the team is irrelevant, actually, you know, like my, with my children and stuff. My, my eldest son, uh, it was really funny, he wanted to, like, he puts $1 bets on sports bet and stuff like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't really understand the NRL at all. No. Um, but there was last year there was a game that was the Sharks versus Manly where Talakai, um, uh, the Sharks centre, dominated the Manly team. Yeah. And that was the first player's name he really learnt and understood he was and could recognise in public. And then as it progressed throughout last year, he got more and more involved and learnt more players' names and things mm. like that. And that yeah, that's one of the biggest problems with like Sheffield Shield cricket and a lot of the cricket in Australia is you just don't know who's playing and you don't know any of the players. And even if you do know the players, like Dave Warner played... It was two games for the Sixers. Yeah, I know. I couldn't have named any of the other players. No, that's right. And I think when you lose the public's interest, when the public can't follow, then how can they be interested? Then how can the sport itself be interesting? And yeah. then in the end, that you know what that affects? Uh, eyeballs. And eyeballs equal marketing dollar, sponsorship dollar. And that's really what the game's turned yeah. into. So we've got to make sure we don't lose that structure because it's important. So, I mean, I... You know how many times you have these conversations when you're sitting at the at the club having a, a little feed and a and a spring water with a bit of lemon like I do, but you know what I mean? Yeah, every time it's cricket's brought up it del- deteriorates into this conversation yeah. actually. Yeah. And that's one of the other big issues I have with cricket. We very rarely talk about the matches when we're talking about cricket, like when I'm with my friends and stuff at the club talking about cricket, we very rarely talk about the matches that just happened or the competition that just happened. It always starts with something like, did you see cricket on the weekend? Yes, we have a quick conversation. Then move into, man, what is cricket going to do to get popularity back? That's right. (laughs) Because it's... Well, you just said it before about the... Remember the AFL grand final would happen. The week after was the NRL grand final. Yeah. And then the week after that was Bathurst. The, The Bathurst 1000 was on. And then the week after that, for all states was their first one day domestic match and we used to pack out only up the road mm. at North Sydney Oval for 16,000 people. Mm. They used to watch that game hanging out of the trees. Mm, mm. Mm. Does that, and because of the rhythm, everyone understood and mm. families, you know, ma, you know the, the son and daughter were like, mum and dad, you know, the grand final's on, then this is on, then that's on. So the family worked into that structure. So you're right, today, it's a toss of the coin. Yeah, I've got no, no idea. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, what, what we do on here, Gavin, is we have a segment called um, Honestly, Guys, It's Just Our Opinion, and we're going to make a start on that segment right now. Um, seeing as you're an expert on spin bowling, um, we thought we'd go down that path and ask the question, 
whether Nathan Lyon will reach Shane Warne's tally of 708 test wickets. He currently has 530 test wickets from 129 tests. Um, he's number three among Australian bowlers of all time in test cricket with Warne on 708, Glenn McGrath on 563. So Lyon with 530 wickets from 129 tests, he takes 4.1 wickets a test match. So he needs 178 more to catch Warren. So taking wickets at the same rate, he'd need to play 43 more tests to catch him. So in total, he'd need to play 172 tests. So I guess that's our debate, well, whether he'll get there and, and sort of where Nathan Lyon sits mm. among the all-time great Australian bowlers. Um, firstly, I think he can get there yeah. because players play. That you know, once you got to 33, 34, you used to shake, you used mm. to panic going to pre-season training, waiting for the coach to say, "Look, I think you have maybe got one year left." You know, and and you immediately start to think, "What am I going to do? What have I studied? Am I heading to Centrelink like I did?" But the I think no, these days they played all 37, 38, yeah. 39, 40. Some have played at 41, like Anderson mm. still does. So I think mm. he can get it. Yeah. The other thing about it is, if there's any young spin bowlers out there and you wonder what it... Oh, I'm not as good as Nathan Lyon. I, I just can't do what he does. Then you need to find the old footage and see Nathan when he was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 22 even. He used to be a very sort of... He'd come in, he, he'd float the ball a lot. Um, he didn't drive over the top as much. Um, he spun the ball probably 50% less, where in these last nine years, definitely, he has created a genuine, consistent run-up. He hits the crease very strong but very balanced, and it's it's an explosion. Yeah. It's not unbe- He's not being nice. He's exploding, not only with his body and his shoulder and his arm over the top, but his fingers are ripping. And he doesn't, like my worst habit, it was getting t- like you'd undercut the ball, and so if you watch now, so many finger spinners undercut the ball because the toughest thing to do is to be able to hook the wrist at an angle where it can drive over the top. Mm-hmm. Mm. And but once you you know keep working the wrist in how you're holding it, getting it and getting the the fingers to be strong enough to hold that ball on its own and really rip over, those two fingers become so prominent. And for me, that's why he became what he is. And to me, that's why I think his last three to four years, which I think he can do, he can he can work at five wickets a test match. I honestly believe that. He's he locks batsmen down. Um, Arapili Prasanna said to me, bowling to um, Azaruddin and Sachin Tendulkar and Rahul Dravid for, and Ganguly, for example, he said, "You've got to be able to spin it hard." So when the ball comes down to the greatest batsman in the world, mind you, it needs to, in its last six metres, it needs to drop quick. Mm. Well, theoretically, it's about, probably, about, probably about four metres. Mm. But it needs to drop quick because that immediately tells the batsman, uh-oh, what's going on? How's that dropping so quick? So it immediately says to you, it's spinning hard. because it's. But what, what it's doing is dropping quickly. Because it's spinning hard, that means it's going to turn also. And that is a major worry. And the only reason you know that, if Sachin Tendulkar is the greatest batsman in the world and he runs down at you and you do that and he defends or, or blocks it with his pad, you know, oh, my God, I'm actually doing okay. Mm. And that's what Nathan Lyon does yeah. constantly. Mm. And he owns it. And that, to me, that's why he's going to be the GOAT. And I've got no problem with it. Mm. And I say to young people, watch and learn. And don't get upset when you're 16, 17, 18 and you're not sure. It's, isn't it funny? I, if I bring tennis back in again, you look at, you know, everybody called Roger Federer the GOAT and then Novak Djokovic and Rafael Nadal have gone past him for majors. One now and now there's question marks over. Well, I mean, it's, you know, statistically Djokovic and Nadal have gone ahead of Federer in this yes. instance. You go, well, if Nathan Lyon does get to 708 test wickets and goes past Shane Warne, there's mm. just no, there's really not many people who are going to be prepared to say that because Nathan Lyon's stats are better, or 
because he's gone past Shane Warne in test wickets, yeah. that that puts him ahead of Warne. There's just no, no. no nobody's going to be saying It's that. the same with Sir Donald yeah. Bradman. Same thing. Yeah. So that's the way it is. But, yeah. you know, it'll just be uh, something that he's endured and earned. I'm sure he'll get there. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to not get too carried away with stats because I think the yeah. game has changed so much. It's hard, so much it's hard to define the 70s to 90s statistics yeah. up against today because... Mm. Um, the cricket grounds have changed, the wickets have changed, and Even the cricket the bats, bats... Yeah, the bats are very different. <laughs> the, the bats are so strong and powerful now, it's almost like they can vote and they've got their own tax file number. <laughs> it's, it's, but, and I got told by a couple of players about four or five years ago, they said, Robbo, it doesn't matter now, if I come down at you and I still don't think I'm going to get it, I hit through the ball as hard as I can... And I said, well, what if you get a leading edge? He said, I only need to get 40%. It can still go for four or six. Wow. Mm. Yeah, That's how strong the bats are now. Massively. That's how I kind of... I have this conversation with a lot of young people around, like my kids and their friends and stuff, like around sports and their comparison to modern modern athletes versus yeah. old athletes. And one of the things that we've discussed on this podcast is like that confusion around like if you took someone from the 60s, 70s, 80s and put them in the modern game... Yeah. People will often say, but they wouldn't be able to compete. But then my argument to that is, no, they would be able to compete because they would have the same training structures and That's equipment right. as mm. the people today have. So if you yeah. took Donald Bradman into the modern game today mm. with those bats, you can't even imagine what heights he would actually have reached. Well, the biggest question from a coaching perspective is bowling for me, and um, in the T20 game especially. Uh, but um, bowlers tell me today... Oh, no, no Robbo, no, we've got six or seven or sometimes eight different types of deliveries that we bowl. I said, okay, so what, what does that mean? Well, you know, we practice hard, and um, but we try to, you know, work on each ball, but it's hard to get them all totally perfect and, and then get them perfect under pressure. But I always felt that uh, myself and Brad McNamara years ago would be, before a, a first uh, a one-day game, you know, we would train with the team, but, you know, the last... 45 minutes of the day we'd be on our own bowling and trying to own 90 times out of 100 mm. the bottom of middle and off and then we choose okay is it going to be the bottom of middle and we're talking Yorkers here but the point is imagine if you say to me okay you're I'll okay, go John all of a sudden you're Glenn Maxwell and I'm going to bowl really good Yorkers at you and you are so good at doing the ramp right the ramp and you ramp the first one, and I go for six. And you've ramped it off, um, let's say you've done it off, off stump, middle and off. What if you ramp the next one off middle? Okay, and all of a sudden I'm none for 12. But what if I bowl, I come a bit closer to the stumps and bowl that good Yorker as a leg cutter on middle and leg, and you accidentally miss it? Which can happen when you bowl a very good ball. Yeah. So your LBW, and I've now got one for 12, and yes, your team's got 12. And the next batsman comes out and does the exact same thing. So let's say he's a bit luckier. He goes six, six, and four off three balls. But let's say I get the fourth ball right again, because hopefully I know what I'm doing. And all of a sudden now, I've got, wow, I've got two for 28. But what if that keeps going and all of a sudden I've got four for 50? I think the four for 50 really affects the outcome for that batting team mm. Mm. what if the other bowl at the other end grabbed two during that time yeah. what if there's six for and decisions have to be made in the dressing room so the ownership of a Yorker and knowing how to bowl one but how to bowl a different one and where and if you own it you can become so deadly I, I, I really don't care how great of a ramper as a cricket <laughs> shot you are yeah yeah. that's one of the actually that's actually a good point because bowling and I don't know how much the balls have changed over the time. Like bat, bats, pitches and everything has changed. But I don't know how much a ball can change. And so bowling is a... I'd go as close to say the balls have even got more perfect. They're, they're so clinically well made. And yeah. Yeah, they're very good. So. And so a, as a bowler, you, you are kind of stuck in technique and ability over improvements to inqui- equipment and things like that, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. There's more to being a better cricket player as a bowler. I might be being harsh to batsmen, but is it okay? But if because when you say that, I immediately feel like to, uh, I need to ask you two both. Mm. I need your opinion on this. I need to know you're at home, right? Mm. And depending on what game it is, 
But if you're seeing the batsman, it's, let's say it's a T20 game, and he's to- or, or 50 over game, and they're totally dominating the bowler, and he's hitting fours or she's hitting fours and sixes, etc. Is that is that great, or is it great when the two people are battling against each other, the bowler and the batter? It, what's that like for you? Um. You, you, if you, you want me to be brutally honest, if you, I, I know you said in T20 or 50 over cricket, but if we were to bring test cricket into that conversation yeah, yeah, same, as well. Yeah, same thing. I've got to be honest, I think, and this is probably a controversial opinion, maybe, but I, I think the test cricket's at its best when the bowlers are all over the batsmen. I, I love it when there's carnage. I love it when it's a two and a half day test match in Hobart or somewhere like that, yeah. or New Zealand where the ball's doing a lot. Um, and the bowlers are running, ripping through the ba- I find that to be the most entertaining cricket. I know there's other people who say they like to see maybe a bit more of a contest between yeah. bat and ball, like, yeah. um, like say, you know, if teams are scoring about 280, 300 an innings each, that's a good balance. Yeah. I, I reckon it's at its best when you've got poles flying everywhere and you've got the bowlers all over the bats. And I'm not just saying that because you're a bowler. That's, that's, that, that's my yeah. honest opinion. That's the most entertaining cricket. Well, you too, John. Do you, do, you, do you see the battle between two people? Like a bowler trying to work out the batsman, but the batsman going, he's working me out, or she is. I've got to get my front foot outside off more, know what to let go, know what to play, know where my singles are so I can c- continually get off strike. Do you no, like- I, I tend to like bowling, watching bowling more than batting, to be honest. So... I don't like if a bowler is like dominating. I never like any sport, any sporting event. It doesn't matter what it is, like whether it's boxing or, or tennis mm-hmm. or cricket or golf, yeah. where someone is just over, one side is just overly dominating. So I want that battle. Yeah. But I much prefer beautiful night. And again, I'm not just saying it because you're a bowler, <laughs> but um, I much prefer beautiful to see beautiful bowling over batting because I have that really like. Um, preconceived thing about equipment improvement so yeah. it's so much easier as you said like it's so much easier to hit sixes and fours with the bats and stuff now whereas i kind of feel i, I don't know like just in my head that the when the bowler does something beautiful it's mm. it's something that i want to behold whereas when a batsman just smashes a six i just go yeah okay it's just another six it's on top I, of that i'll tell you what you, you watch uh, you, you watch a test match in india and you get the batting team two for 350 after day one on a road yeah that's that's boring that's extremely boring yeah, to me. yeah it is yeah. I, I i don't want to watch that yeah, that's i do want to watch bowlers all over the batsman stumps flying everywhere that as a viewer i'll sit down and watch that I won't watch it too for 350 after day one. Well, well, not la- just in India, but anyway. Yeah. La- last that. year, inside three weeks, uh, I was speaking at one New South Wales prison and three weeks later, a high school. I got the exact same question. Uh, and, and it was basically, how could I, can I remember or define, uh, uh, you know, the best or perfect moment in the game that happened? And people expect you to say, oh, you know, scoring 150 or mm. or taking six far and to be honest it wasn't it was it was for me it was it's when you everyone out there in sport on their club sport or playing for their country whatever it is they'll face the moment where they go i want to win what do i do now what do we do as a team now and i i'd, I'd met um i was talking about Eripili prasano and we must he said to Stephen War, he said, oh, you guys not really sure what you're doing, are you? <laughs> and it was a very straight, strong comment. And Stephen was always a very on the front foot type of person. He said, well, OK, yeah, well, what, what do you mean? And obviously it was uh, the first two tests, we were getting dominated by magnificent Indian batting. Their, their top six was incredible. And, and I'm sitting there, with, uh, what he, and he said, well, and I just spoke about, about Nathan Lyon. But learning to make that ball spin hard and drop. Mm. Mm. And that was, and for me, I thought, wow, this sounds so interesting. Could I do this? How do I do this? And I listened and wrote everything down. Then three days later, the third test starts. And I'm thinking, Mark Taylor, what a lovely man. My, my captain, he's bringing me on 11 minutes before lunch. Mm. And what does that say to a spin bowler? Great. 
I can get two overs in, hopefully none for none or one for none. I get my rhythm, I start, then I can have lunch and get going the next session. And I always say, do you know how difficult it is to eat butter chicken and rice <laughs> when you are, have you gone to lunch at none for 31 off two overs? Oh, God. Yes. So yeah. immediately I was sitting at lunch thinking, what am I going to do? And Navjot Singh Sidhu, he absolutely smashed me. He was a very, very good batsman. And I thought, what am I going to do? I'm gone here. I don't know what to do. And I was, I had to wait about an hour. Mark Taylor brings me back on. And Steve Waugh says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm lengthening my run up. He goes, what? What do you mean? I said, I'm lengthening it by three metres. Three steps. I'd normally bowl off eight. I took it back to 11. Mm. He said, what, what, why? I said, I'm going to do what Erapili Prasanna told us the other night at the, at the dinner. He said, now? I said, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 and I, I just realised, I've got to go for it here. You've yeah. got to take your learnings and back yourself. And I thought, I'm going to do everything he said. Yes, I'm going to run in a bit quicker with a bit more stronger rhythm, but I'm going to bowl it a bit quicker and spin it as hard as I can. Mm. And yes, I felt like a medium pace off spinner. But what happened was, I did it all to Sachin Tendulkar, first ball. And he ran at me. And all of a sudden, because of the speed of the ball, and the ball dropped. And he immediately stopped, pulled his back foot back inside the crease and put his front foot out to try and defend. The ball went through bat and pad, spun, went past Sachin Tendulkar, missed Ian Healy's shoulder, that's how much it bounced, and went for four buys. And I was the only one on the field other than the two Indian batsmen that was happy because we just got, <laughs> we went for four buys and I thought... Oh my God, mm. it happens, it works, I'm going to do this. And how do I go for none for 31, thinking my career is over, off two overs, and I ended up with five wickets in the test match, and, and we won the test match. But my point is, mm. sometimes young people out there are going to face these things of moments where I don't know what to do, I'm scared, I'm getting beaten, this person's all over me. So sometimes you've got to just keep listening to your dad or your mum or your coaches or or the people you get you know you watch on youtube or whatever you're watching on television you see someone write this stuff down because there's moments when you can need that information to you back yourself and use it what, what was it like bowl, that, that feeling of bowling to to someone of the stature or ten did that was that just like a surreal experience you'd walk, run it well Walking, thinking I'm actually oh. bowling to this guy on the biggest. Have stage. you two had children? Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I yeah. 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 When you're watching, when you're holding your wife's hand, hoping the baby's okay, and like I can't even describe the nerves. I was panicking and nervous. And I was stressing. Like it's not much different. Like he, he was astonishing player, Sachin. He's a, a lovely man. Everyone thinks he's he's very quiet, but he's just a, a lovely human being. But I remember. Uh, here's an example. Can you imagine being Sachin Tendulkar? So we're playing at Calcutta, 116,000 people, Eden oh Park. And uh, Navjot Singh gets 92. I get VVS Laxman caught out, caught behind off Ian Healy for 98. I'm thinking, wow, I've got a wicket, you beauty. And we're talking. The team's talking. Great, you know, this is a good effort. Let's keep going. We've got to keep... And then all of a sudden... All that you can see is mouths moving and you cannot hear your teammates because the 116,000 people have just seen Sachin Tendulkar walking on the Italian marble tiles to enter the field. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine how loud the crowd yeah. yearned for their, their king? Yeah. They love him. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things I always talk about is I was at the um, 2015 World Cup semi-final in yeah. versus Australia. Yeah. I've been to so many sporting events in my life yeah. you know, like the UFC I was at the Dragons Grand Final when they won I've never heard anything louder no. <laughs> then when Dave Warner got out for 11 yeah. the Indian crowd like I was with a guy who had to block his ears because it was so loud yeah. uh, it was really like you know we, I was I was in a, actually like with a group of Indian people as well fans yeah. so that was terrifying for me but it was like an Indian home game and I've mm. never heard anything like, I can't imagine more than 100,000 well, people. For well, <laughs> well, Dan just said, you know, how do you react or what do you do? And I remember thinking, walking back, thinking I'd gone from 30 seconds, 60 seconds earlier, I've got a wicket, to 
oh my god, I'm going to bowl to the greatest bowl, uh, batsman in the world. The crowd listened to them, and and I just melted. It's like I could when you used to get the cane at school in the 70s and 80s. Your legs used to go so like you were going to fall over. Yeah. And I, I remember running in, no, all of a sudden, no rhythm, just a little bit short. He went on the back foot and punched it over, <laughs> cover for four. Then he went four, then six. So I was all of a sudden went from the the mayor's office down to the bottom of the birdcage again. So those are the things that can happen yeah, to you yeah. when you're yeah. playing against it. And somehow, to the sports people out there that face those moments, somehow you've got to say to yourself, I'm human. And imagine if I'm 80 and I've only got a, you know, a little bit left in life, what would I want to say to myself to do? And that's when you tell yourself to Just back it. yourself and go for it and start imagining the other way. Imagine, all right, Dan, you've just got Sachin Tendulkar out. <laughs> right, that would be pretty good. You know what I mean? <laughs> or like, yeah. th- these are these are the moments. Yeah, it's like living in another that's reality it. or something. Yeah, yeah that's um, that's uh, in um, mixed martial arts. You know, that's actually I, the thing I give Conor McGregor mm-hmm. following mixed martial arts the most credit for. He won, yeah, he won two championships, but he won a round against Khabib Nurmagomedov, who never lost a round in his whole career. Yeah, and even though Conor McGregor lost. And got submitted. He won a round. That's right. <laughs> and so, yeah, imagine yeah. if you got such intent all out. Didn't matter what the rest you did for the rest of your career. Yeah, you got such intent all out. Yeah, we look at it so clinically. Win and loss is just two words. Yeah, you got to look. You're right. Look at the other things within and see the benefits. I think I remember reading that Tendulkar has to go shopping at, or he goes out driving at you know two or three o'clock in the morning because at no other time of day can he sort of <laughs> you know, get, 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 get any breathing space in India. Yeah. Um, I was just coming back to what we were talking about before, just quickly before we wrap up this. Honestly, guys, it's just our opinion segment. Um, just about what you were saying in terms of as a viewer, what do you want to see? And I remember when, when I was a kid, um, Mark War was my favourite player to the point where mm. I'd get nervous when he would come out to bat. Yeah. And then if you'd get out for a duck, it would ruin my day or week. And, it, <laughs> and, it, and if you'd make a hundred, it would make my day or week. Yeah. I think when you're a kid and you've got that attachment to a player, and I was a bit the same with Ponting, but it, it's a bit different. You, um, but as you get a little bit older, you sort of lose that real attachment to the individual player and you yeah. just think about, well, what's the most entertaining cricket? And, yeah, like in my view, yeah, it is the bowlers being on top and, and taking yeah. wickets all the time. I'd, I'd love to see that's the part, I think, that needs to grow in the game of... Um, here's my point. Um, and India, I'd love to be able to talk to them. Um, what is better? Is, is it better that's having 40, 40 overs of just sixes and fours? Is that good or is the battle some type of value? And can we teach the bowlers greater value of understanding those moments and how to, how to own the moment? Because if you watch the games, especially uh, looking at some of the games lately, the, the pressure moment is when the bowler falls apart and the mm. batsman waits and mm. yearns for that just short of a length because then it's going for six. Mm. So th- these are all the things that... Cause and that's volume of interest in the game. So let's, mm. you know, it's up to coaches to own, players to own and... And you know, the, for the game to level out and, and yeah. continually be interesting. And you, you got a lot of advantages for batsmen now. You know, the, the batting pitches, the power, more powerful bats, the ropes being brought yeah. in. Yeah. Um, these are advantages that you know um, the batsmen didn't used to have, and it seems like it's really stacked in yeah. the favour of the batsmen now. And they'll probably say, "Look, we feel we're getting more public interested because they like seeing sixes and fours." The other Not thing is, yeah, yeah well, what happens if they get to that point of in five or ten years, can they get bored from that? But yeah. can, can we not lose the art of the game? That's the thing about about 2020 cricket as well. You see a six hit in a test match and you go, oh, wow, that doesn't happen very often. No. In 2020 cricket, it happens all the time. All the time. It sort of desensitises you to the sixes being hit. Yeah, now we get more excited by a full over of sixes over yeah. just one six. Like, it's amazing to watch. Did you say desensitise, Dan? That's, you know what? You could become, a mag- not only you're magnificent at this, but you could become amazing marital counsellor <laughs> and you could say look Gavin you should say to your wife let's not hold hands morning lunchtime and dinner every day let's do it like on Thursday night when we're going for a walk and Sunday morning on the way to breakfast and then it's special 
<laughs> Thank you. For, you've, t- you've taught me something beautiful. That's, all right. That's great. That's all right. Anyway, that was honestly, guys, it's just therapy. <laughs> No, I, no, I've got something to say to my wife when I get home tonight. Yes. Uh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, great chat. Um, just, I was just going to talk maybe a bit more generally about this Aussie bowling attack. Do you think this this Cummins, Stark, Hazelwood, Lyon, Quartet, where do you rank them? Sort of, a, you, Would you put them alongside the Warren, McGrath, Gillespie, Lee, Quartet? you think they're in that category? Yeah, I, yeah. I put them in. I, I, the nicest way to do it is to put them in the top three of what we've ever had as a group. Mm. Uh, the other thing about it is I do think that they have to bowl on much better cricket wickets. So it is, it is harder for them. It's been the thing that has made Nathan Lyon so good. Um, Josh Hazelwood, his job is basically Glenn McGray hits the top of an ice cream tin lid, and that's what he does constantly. Yeah. Pat Cummins, to me, is the, the difficult one. He, he hits the deck really hard, but he's got to... There's two different types of bowling. Josh, Hazel, Josh Hazelwood, for example, has that slower um, bowling delivery, which allows you... like you can, There's a greater length of being able, as a batsman, being able to see it. Mm. Where Pat Cummins is shorter, faster and tighter, and it makes it very difficult to see. And it's the difference between Brett Lee at 160 kilometres an hour, very clean, clear action, Shoah Bakhtar at 160 kilometres an hour with the ball hidden, was literally frightening. And I was thinking, geez, I hope my my life insurance is with Allianz or someone, <laughs> you know, well, you just can't see it. It's really late when you see the ball, and all of a sudden it's a reaction. And it's trained reactions from practicing facing fast bowling on machines and getting trained to seeing when the, a ball is in a certain area you immediately know it's like boxing yeah it's n- not because how can you in 0.3 of a second make that decision and you've got to make mm. the right decision because the wrong decision you get hit yeah. you get hit so um yeah they're, they're, they're important things i think it's, it is a pretty devastating bowling attack we have right now yeah. um if the summer of cricket tells you anything what they did in new zealand was um kind of ridiculous New Zealand's supposed you, to win at home you know yeah and, and they I agree with you on that everyone thought New Zealand were going to do a lot better yeah and I think you don't get any time off with our four bowlers yeah because as soon as Pat Cummins has delivered five stressful overs Josh Hazelwood comes back on to me the one that has spent his entire career being discussed is Mitchell Stark mm. but to me most batsmen don't enjoy facing Mitchell Stark and that's the simplest way. Because he can bowl an astonishing in-swinging Yorker that starts it off and can take the bottom of leg. Then he can bowl a bouncer that can hit you in the head. And he may bowl a wide. But in the last six years, he's, he's cleaned up so much of his bowling. But when you look at his numbers, they're world class. And in the end, he's going to be 50. And he throws out the piece of paper to a young kid. And they look at the numbers. And in the end, his numbers are astonishing. And that's probably the best way. Yes... Josh Hazelwood, clinically perfect. Pat Cummins, yep, very good. Very difficult to see when the ball's coming out. Nathan Lyon, brilliant. But Mitchell Stark is the one where I think, wow, what am I going to get? And Because mm-hmm. at least with the other three I just mentioned, you know what you're going to get mm. as a batsman. So if I ask you another question now, if I go through all those bowls again, Cummins, Stark, Hazelwood, Lyon, Warren, McGrath, Gillespie, Lee, if you had to put those eight into four... Which four would you would you go for? Um, for me, it would be um, Mag- well. I'd, I'd literally, if we, I, I would run. I'd have no problem, to be honest, running with um, McGrath, Cummins, Warren, and Lyon. Yeah, but I'd okay. be searching for that great Ian Botham. Yeah, that right. great yeah, batsman yeah, yeah, yeah. who's yeah. a great number three bowler. Yeah. Which and if you've got that, you're an unbeatable side. Mm. Um, and if it, if it gets down to three quicks, it would be Pat Cummins, um, um, Glenn McGrath, and I would go with Stark because he just del- he delivers that that moment where the batsman doesn't know. He delivers the time when we d- we don't think we can get this wicket. They're si- they're, they're going well. It's VVS Laxman Rahul Dravid in two thousand and one mm. at Eden Park just owning. You know, three hundred and seventy odd partnership. What are we going to do? Mm. To me, Mitchell Stark's the guy that can find something so that's why that's what i would have but i tell you when you bring that subject up there's probably a lot of people either sitting at the dinner table or at the pub or you know 
starting to ask that same question. It's a it's a discussion with at a barbecue, really. Mm. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Just looking now at the the recent form of both Steve Smith and Marnus Labuschagne. They've had their struggles recently. Steve Smith averaged just 12.75 in that New Zealand series. Um, Marnus Labuschagne, not much better. Um, averaged 24.75. He did make that 90. Um, it's even come with um, Peter Fitzsimon saying Smith should be replaced as opener. Um, hmm. I mean, uh, they're quite... I guess he's maybe jumping the gun a bit considering the next test series isn't yeah. against isn't until next summer against India. Yeah. Um, so there is plenty of time for you know, it's not as if there's another series in a couple of mm. weeks. I mean there's there's time for him to regain form by then. Um, yeah, probably a, li- a little bit disappointing those two in that New Zealand series. What did actually what did Peter Fitzsimon say? He said he I, thinks, I only asked because he was oh, he was yeah. a very good um, Wallaby forward, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he got very lucky. He mar- <laughs> married, a, married a very smart, um, lovely lady. She's a very smart lady, and and yeah, um, yeah he, and he has a beautiful he... red cap that he wears. <laughs> I'd be interested to see what he said. Yeah, he said he wanted Cameron Bancroft to come in and replace Steve Smith as opener. Um, Cameron Bancroft's numbers in Test cricket haven't been all that good um i think it's um 26.2 average from 18 innings for bancroft so. well i agree with bancroft I, i'm searching for someone that yearns for their their wicket has the technique that can stable or stabilize that and 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 bat long periods he a batsman like him enables partnerships to happen and bats, who bats through with the, an opening partnership and he bats with the number four, et cetera, and creates runs. Partnerships are so important. Mm. I just like Bancroft. I don't think he's been given the, the greatest of deals. I don't know what's happened uh, mm-hmm. behind the scenes. Yeah, we've had extensive conversations and conjecture about where it's such a strange um, situation now. It's just, just getting weirder and weirder and weirder, I think. That's right. I think, you know, I'd like to search, in Test cricket especially, let's search for technique and, and owning mentally what you do as a, bat, a batter. But w- with regard to Steve Smith and Manus Labuschagne, let's say, and you've just spoken about that they've had a, some difficult periods of late. Mm. Let's pretend for one minute we're not sitting together and we're just at the pub and we're having a, a lasagna and a, a lemonade. I'd be firstly saying... So have you stopped for one minute? Just forget about all of the rubbish that you're in in your mind. You're struggling. You're averaging six and, and 11. Now the media's writing about you and socials have got an opinion. And have you ever stopped and looked at who you are, firstly, what you've actually done in the game? Now pretend you're 15 and you hope and dream that you could be that. So you've already shown us over numerous years that you are all of that that you dreamt of. You are brilliant players. So can you explain to me why you feel it important to spend your life looking like you're stressing and worrying about today, the game, who you are, how you're going to go today, how you're going to cope tonight, will you sleep? You look like seriously the most two stressful people, which you, right now, just for one moment, pretend you are bricklaying today or you're driving a truck to Melbourne, you're going to get a break, then you've got to drive the next one back. Pretend you've got a normal life and start seeing who you are, how talented you are, go back to the simple basics, you versus the bowler, you versus the ball, and go and bring that talent to the game today and get rid of all this other dribble that you are going on with mentally here. Because that I think it's a waste of time to be so clinically talent, talented and have proven it to this nation mm. and the world for many, many years, yet fall in holes. Like all of us, we've been in holes. And as one old man said to me, luckily, when he found me in the hole, if you don't understand and love and own the smell of the bottom of the birdcage, Gavin, do you ever think you're going to love what the top of the tree can look like and feel like and smell like? So it's okay to be down here because without all these learnings, you'll never become that up there. And those guys have already been up there, so they know what it's like. So I'm, I'm glad we've got them. And I think that they should just spend the rest of their career. Marnus has got a long way to go. And for Steve Smith, whatever he's got left, spend the rest of your career bringing that out, all those learnings. Go and enjoy 
go and deliver. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, um, to be fair to Smith, he averaged sixty in that West Indies series. Yeah, that highest score of ninety one, ninety eight. So he clearly had the best average of any Australian batsman of that series. Mm. Mm. Kawaja was next best with forty six point three three. So, so these calls by Peter Fitzsimons, you know, getting on Steve Smith's back, maybe he's a bit premature there. Yeah, mm. yeah. I, th- I, I don't know what it is with Steve Smith. Whenever he goes out of form, the media immediately jumps on and says, oh, you know, is he at the end? Is that the kind of end of his career and things yeah. like that? Is that the end of his Australian career? But he always comes back. That's one of the... We've, we've mentioned it before. Yeah. Like, you, you've just got to pick him because he'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. Average is 61.5 batting at number four in tests. Average is 67.07 batting at number three in tests. Exactly. I don't think he should open, though. That was. I think that's been a mistake. I think he, for some reason he's just trying to find another interest or feeling like he's getting to the point where he needs to own a position uh, I don't think he needs to do any of that mm, but yeah. pr- primarily my, my only message was the first message of knowing how good you are in delivering that but secondly is when you do get out just realize it's a mistake don't, you know don't don't look like you're going to cry and pray to the Lord you look very stressed yeah he always does you right and, and they, they both cause people at home mm. like with the young kid saying to mum or dad oh well, is he okay what's going on is What's happened? Is it really bad? Like, there's a lot of this stuff happens, and I find that out through different parts of my life and hearing these stories. So just, mm. you know, something goes wrong on a field, head up, yeah. walk off with some pride. It didn't go well today. Keep your head up. Move mm. on. Mm. And teach others to do that. Don't sort of drag yourself along the ground. So. Yeah, and Jared Waitley did mention that about Labuschagne too. He said he felt like Labuschagne was a bit lost, lost in his own head, mm. T- too much of a, of a perfectionist... Um, yeah, just saying that Labuschagne seems trapped in his own head a little bit and he's overthinking everything. Well, to, to Labuschagne and Smitty, but to both of them, don't, don't delete a brilliant talent with confused negative habits. Yeah, mm, 100%. Don't, don't from a proven performance. Don't he's do just that. out of form at the moment. Steve Smith's a little bit more out of form across all, all um, formats, actually. That's one of the... My only worry with Steve, and I'd be interested... I mean, you guys, What? how, how old are you? Um, 44. Okay. At 35, 37, 38, did you find anything with your eyes starting to change? Oh, See? everything. It's, yeah, it's just deterioration. Now I have two pairs of glasses yeah. as well. Join what? the club. What, you, what about yeah, you, Dan? I'm 36. Yeah. yeah. So it's gonna I, I was going year. fine <laughs> until about 34, and all of a sudden just started to not... Something happened, and I think at mid 30s, I was told by the optometrist, but mid 30s, especially with cricket, and they talk about it in America with baseball, mm. your eyes can start to change. And remember, Ricky Ponting was just the most astonishing player, mm. and even he got to sort of late 30s, and things started to change. So yeah, they can't fix aged aging in eyes yet. No. So it is one of the things, and cricket especially with batsmen, with the ball, as you were talking about before, ball coming at you, yeah. 160 kilometres an hour. Mm. Um, it is, I can totally understand. I just, I think, yeah, I think that what you said before is really actually, um, it really raises a really good point that maybe Steve Smith is looking for a new challenge. But I think from a fan perspective and people who are wanting Australia to do well, we would all prefer Steve Smith to just go back to what he's best at, mm. three or four, and then just dominate for us. Yeah, and I think you know, create the. I think it's important timing really for Australia to go. One of the most primary things in a cricket team is the opening partnership, and I think if you look right through from the seventies, but very much into, for me, um, very much David Boone and um, uh, Jeff Marsh, mm. and then Mark Taylor and Michael Slater. Uh, Matthew Hayden, Justin Langer. And I look around the success of those teams from those two opening partnerships, uh, or three partnerships, and I think that it's a a very big role. And to anyone playing the sport on the weekend, you're playing for your club, you and your opening partner, you go out, same as the two opening bowlers, it's a partnership, and it's, it's it's the start of our team's mindset, where we get to in that first half an hour or that first hour and all of that dribbles down to the other players how we're feeling how we're going and sadly you can never really delete that uh, emotional stuff coming through but it's an important role so i hope that we don't forget that mm. Mm. yeah 100 percent. just sort of moving it along um gonna take you back to the start of the summer now with australia winning that cricket world cup in 2023 mm. um, in november last year it was an extraordinary result. Such underdogs in that final. They lost their first two games of the tournament 
winning nine in a row to claim that title. That um, partnership by Travis Head and Marnus Labuschagne in the final, just extraordinary. Uh, you, you know what? I could, I could dribble on. I could dribble on here. Feel free to dribble on. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> but let's, I reckon let's just do the truth. And I think... And you guys just jump in, please. Because yep. I think um, the public opinion... or the We always talk about it sitting at a pub just talking about sport. Those opinions are definitive. And I think that so many contracts fly around for creators. They just... It becomes a job. Mm. And I think they get used to that. But I think those first two losses reminds uh, an individual, I'm, I'm representing not myself. I'm representing 26 million people. I dreamt about this as a kid. Imagine if we come together as a group and we start to play well. Imagine if we win, 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 and we get to a final, then we get the chance to win a medal or a cap or a flag or a trophy. Then, then I actually get at 45 or 50 or 50, I get something called legacy. And I think that's what happened. Mm. I think for, all of a sudden, because they play so much cricket today, mm. so much, it's yeah, a, it's a job. Yeah. Business to business to business. What have I got next? What have I got now? And then all of a sudden, mm. the media jumped on them. We're two nil down, we're struggling. Oh yeah, we were hammering them. Yeah. <laughs> well, look what, well, look what we did. And I think that's a, an, a, a, a mental health point of view. It's a learning. I think it's in, incredibly important to to be to get to play a a test match for your country or to get to go to a world cup primarily it's unbelievable to me that's what that's why i think the olympics is so important you know imagine earning an olympic medal i mean a lot mm. of people laugh at the cricket when we went to the commonwealth games and and i never forget how upset we were to lose the gold medal we we got a silver medal but i'm telling you now at 58 years of age that medal still sits in my yeah. oh yeah wardrobe yeah, i don't because i think Imagine an earning an Olympic medal or a Commonwealth Games medal. So mm. let's not lose those uh, the the beauties of what you just said. World Cups, uh, mm. World Cups. Mm. So I'm I hope yeah. that stays with us because yeah. look what we did. We were unbelievable. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. And what was a bit sad after it was you know if I come back to the 1999 World Cup, you had a ticker tape parade with you know Shane Moore and Steve Waugh, thousands of people in the CBD. This World Cup. Pat Cummins comes back and there's a few people at the airport, um, you know, waving to him. You know, it was... Um, I, I would have thought a team that's just won a World Cup like that deserved much more than that on their return. Well, in my other life, I received about 70, 80 emails all around the exact same subject you just brought up and basically asking... Um, a couple questions asked, had cricket or the government organised a return? Mm. But here's the point, is that why did a, a not a, a, congratulati, a con congratulations return happen? Why did... Because we've been used to it. And all of a sudden, it, it just didn't happen. And that really surprised a lot of older people, not so much younger people. Younger people's lives move so fast. Yeah. You know, iPad to iPhone to d this and that. I'm getting... So the world has changed, yes. But I, what you've just said is incredibly important. It's been deleted. It's been forgotten about. And I think mm. we should start throwing that question out. I kind of think that it comes a lot to new generation. I feel like such an old person when I say talk about stuff like that, but um, sport is by the vocal minority frowned upon hmm. uh, in a lot of the younger generations, actually. So as a vocal minority, sporting attendance is sporting across all sports, sporting attendance is sporting uh, ratings and stuff are going up, but sporting sentiment on the internet is very low. And so a lot of sports and governments are afraid to put themselves out by organising something like that, like a congratulations, welcome home, because of the sentiment will come out on the internet. But there's becoming more of a swing around the understanding of, in corporations, stuff like that, that it's a vocal minority. So, yeah, for a, for a period of time with the rise of social media, like the last 10 years, a lot of people have thought like, oh, we can't do that because mm. everyone will complain. Yeah. And it's like everyone will complain. But now there's a realisation that it's actually not everyone. It's no. a very small number of people and we should really look at the reality of the situation. Yeah. Because, yeah, like um, like I see it a lot on my job, on my day-to-day -day when I'm doing social media stuff. There is like a, no a lot of negative sentiment about all types of sports. Like um, the attitudes towards sports stars, the attitudes towards spending on sports and things like that.
Yeah. And so I think that came into it like a lot when they were making these decisions. I had this belief that like maybe Cricket Australia and the government were like, oh, we probably shouldn't do anything because everyone will be really grumpy and angry and yeah. complain about it. Oh, we've wasted so much money and media time when we should be fixing schools or whatever. Yeah. But it's, it is just based on a vocal minority. And I'm hoping that is changing now and we're getting more um, towards it. So when we win the next World Cup, we'll be back to how we were. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I totally agree. I think it's important. I think it's... Um We've got a yearn. To, uh, what's the saying? I was growing up, and my father saying too much of one thing constantly, you'll lose the value. I know what it was. <laughs> Remember this? You'll laugh at this. Remember the lollies fantails? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. They just recently ended their cycle, and mm. they don't make them anymore. Well, I obviously, stupidly liked them far too much, and I'd just be into one after the other. He said, "What are you doing?" You know. And after a few few times, three or four times, yeah, he said, "No, you're going to get three, and that's it. And then tomorrow, you'll get three more." And it made me stop and. Instead of just taking, taking, taking. It's no different with sport. We, I wonder if we just get so much, mm. and we're not, we're, obviously we're talking so much cricket, day by day by day. Are we losing the, the value of the taste and yearning for imagination of can't wait for that next game and it's like yeah. what the NFL does. Can't wait for our next opportunity. Yes, we've spoken about our loss or our win for three days. Now we're speaking about our possibility of winning for another three days. Mm. Game day comes, then we start again, and it's yeah. a it's a good structure. Yeah. So I think we were talking about Tendulkar before. I think it was him who said, you know, twenty twenty cricket should be treated like the dessert, not the main course. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> there's too much, definitely too much twenty twenty cricket around yeah. the world, and there's too much of an emphasis by domestic cricket competitions in building up their twenty twenty cricket. Like the South African team sent their. C team oh. to New Zealand because yeah, yeah. they wanted everyone yeah. to stay and play. Well, you know who? Well. I mean, India owns South African T20 cricket, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. And I think, look, as we said earlier in our chat today, uh, that India run world cricket, and yeah. I'm proud of them. But I hope they understand that there's got to be a legacy yeah. and we need them to own and create legacy. And all the things that they saw in how England treated them for, let's say, half a century move from that and show us the learnings and create the great game worldwide that it needs to be. Mm. Speaking of Indian cricket, the IPL's just got underway. Um, unfortunately, Mitchell Stark is struggling a bit. He's um, His collective figures are none for 100, conceding 12.5 <laughs> runs and over, so hasn't taken a wicket. I saw a headline in one of the papers, none for $630,000. Oh, um, I, could I knew that would come. <laughs> yeah, so he's got that um, $4.43 million contract with the Kolkata Knight Riders, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously they're going to want a bit more bang for their buck at some I, point. I and that's, yeah, that's what happens, um, and the game's become very much about the, the financial outcome and and I think that I mean you look at the some of the teams and, and looking at I mean um, the Royal Challengers from Bangalore it's, it's a team back with serious coin um, Kolkata have always had serious they've got serious coin yeah so the players how how can how can any human think okay I've got to search for that three million dollar deal I've got to do it Imagine if I get two or three of those. Yeah. Whole life changes. And it's, it's, yeah, like the there was the thing about Shamal Joseph when he was here that was, like, I thought was really disappointing. He had such a good um, match in the test match. And then his entire plan was to then go and play in the UAE domestic competition. Yeah. Well, the West Indies team was still in Australia, still doing, it's doing one days and stuff like that. But he had already planned to go off to a T20 domestic competition mm. for the money. Unfortunately, he got injured and missed out. Um, and that, that is one of the things. Like there's, so, there's so much money in the IPL and then as an yeah. offshoot, other domestic competitions. I know there's rules around international players in the IPL as yeah. well. Like they're only allowed to have three international players on the field at the <laughs> same time or something. Well, they have changed that, haven't they? I mean, you know, I think they're really trying to... And that's another thing to be careful of because so many Australian players over the last 10 years have moved, you know, gone everywhere. Mm. And... We as a nation and a lot of other nations are losing the framework of their players and where they yeah. are. Mm. So it, it's there's a lot of important decisions to be made for cricket. Yeah, I think it's in Australia, especially like with the BBL, was a really really big thing. You know, mm. it was really good. And of course, they kind of broke it a little bit when they extended the season and stuff. And now they've scaled it back. But in reality, during the BBL, we stopped paying attention because our players weren't here. Yeah, they were off. They were playing in some. Uh, for their country in some matches but they were also off in other domestic 
T20 competitions. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just random ones in different countries. And I read a, a stat there are a few players in the Australian cricket team who are Australian cricket team players that are playing up to 15 domestic T20 comps around the yeah. world throughout the year. Mm. Um, obviously, everyone is trying to duplicate the success of the IPL, but I believe it's to the detriment of world cricket. I agree. Not, and we see it a lot in Australia because we are in Australia. Well, but how I can't would you imagine in the other countries? No, that's right. I mean, we've got situations where a lot of people say to me about Tim David, right? Now, obviously, he's playing for the Mumbai Indians. But then I've had the question, what if we found Tim David 10 years ago? Mm. And I went, yeah, what do you mean? Well, well, would he, would he have come into the Sheffield Shield one day structure? Would he have gone into a BBL team? Uh, would he be a test player? And it's, it's so difficult. I think there's certain players that define their game as a separate game and i'll tell you this is a funny story and i, I it's about two and a bit years ago and i got an email on air and this gentleman lovely man he said uh i'm 74 years of age gavin i love my cricket i watch all cricket that i can see he said you know what he said um i do find that the t20 cricket he says i do get laughed at my local club with my, the guys i do bowling with uh, because I call the T20 cricket very much like American baseball except our game the ball hits the ground first it was really interesting how and and he sort of he went on with it talking about you know that the game there's so many of them mm. they're not sure which one means what yep um, it's really about sixes and fours and boundaries and all these things and it was I think in what you say, it's like it, it makes you start to think. And I, 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 I look at the IPL, and if you see how um, some of the commentators talk about it, um, it's, it's bound around the whole assessment is different than what people understand. You know, the assessment comes down to um, really about how a batsman's hitting the ball, not so much about how a bowler is bowling yeah. and delivering. That's why I've started to pay less attention to uh, T20 because it is less about the bowling. It's so much about the batting, and there's no, not very many interesting bowling battles that go on in it. Like it's there's no battle back and forth. It's just. Do you know where I think the coaching value is? And I'd I'd love to have a small involvement, but I'd love to. I've spoken to Brad McNamara about what we used to do years ago and how you got to that point where you could. How could you? How could? How could you own ninety Yorkers? And if you got the 87th or 88th ball wrong, you went back to naught. How could you own getting 90? And it comes down to practice and mental ownership. Because you have to mentally own it in front of the big crowd mm. with four balls to go. That's when you've got to own it. You've got to train yourself. So I just wonder, I think that coaching opportunity is not in, in batting. Mm. It's in bowling. Yeah, for sure. I think it would be interesting to see if a team actually took that upon themselves to do that and make a change like that. Oh, whether yeah. it would filter through to other teams, whether it would be successful. Because, yeah, like, I used to watch the BBL, I, only the BBL. I'm only interested in Australian cricket, you know. Mm. Like, and the BBL was really good because it had all international superstars as well as, like, Shane Warne playing for it. Oh, know? yeah. And now it's, now it's <laughs> the way of the Sheffield Shield to me. Like, it's just on television. They did get good crowd numbers and good ratings this year, actually, um, from what I understand. But the, the, the fact that every game is the same. And, you know, yeah. there's a complaint about that in all sports that I, I follow, like rugby league, AFL every team tries to match the the main the team that's best at it and it, every game kind of becomes the same and so on yeah. and so forth. but cuz t20 for cricket is so short it's very noticeable hmm. that every game is just the same every match is just the same every team is bowling the same way every team is batting the same way and it's hard for me to watch t20 cricket continuously so i might like flick it on and like you know watch three overs and go okay cool turn yeah. it off um, I, I, it's, I don't know if it's a, like a controversial kind of statement, but I kind of find T20 to now to be the most boring version of cricket. Well, it's only been the um, last two or three years the older players have finally had the courage to discuss it together and talk about this. So we're really finding, and, and through other um, areas that we're in, you know, you you understand that you know the 40 or the 35 year old to 85 year old is exactly where you are. Mm. 
uh, generally, uh, let's call let's talk, talk around the ninety percent of people, and the the T Twenty cricket has the the six to eighteen year old in or twenty year old involved mm. immensely. But so but there, so in a way, there's almost two different types, two different businesses there within that sport. So yeah, so you think that Stark four point four three million, Cummins three point six seven million, as good as they are, you think that's overs for IPL money for those two? Uh, look, I. When you look at those numbers, um, their bowling doesn't always deliver what uh, those numbers feel and sound like. So, um, but I would, <laughs> I, I'd have no problem paying them that coin because, to be honest, their names people walk through the gates, mm-hmm. and it's also that type of business. So I'm not really sitting here just running around statistics and numbers because the games become a little bit like that. And the, what happens is, you know, your brand, which has become last, if you are doing well, if you have two, three or four years where it's not, then it obviously, like many people, slides away. But um, I think, you know, especially both those two, uh, mm. um, Paddy Cummins and Mitch Stark, they deserve that. Mm. But they know themselves they have to deliver. Paddy, numerously, in numerous times, both of them deliver batting down low with the bat. Mm. But um, the other thing about it is, is Paddy can be Paddy being a short of short of length bowler is brilliant at Test cricket and even one day cricket. But at T20 cricket, to be able to because you can swing at any ball with no risk of getting it if you get out so well. Yeah. <laughs> there's no risk, so you need the short short of a length ball to be able to hit for four and six. So in a way, sometimes he can be perfect for the batsman because they need that length. So it's interesting to look at what, how you how he would assess or train to do different things, you know, because he's so good at Test cricket and what he does, and even one day cricket. But it does change what he delivers mm. in T Twenty cricket. Yeah, hundred um, percent. How about the Twenty Twenty World Cup middle of the year? How, how do you rate our chances for that? I think, to be really honest, I think we'll win it. And I I would not have said that eighteen months ago, but I think we immediately. Once, once the World Cup is being announced and the colours change, our mindset changes and we go back to being the 12-year-old kid watching Australia in a World Cup and just yearning to be that person. That's who they are now and I think we will win it. I really do. And I think the other thing I should say is I do think India by far away have the greatest bank of talent and people question me, why do India not win more World Cup series. And I, I say simply, it's easy enough for you to say that, and yes, they have the greatest talent bank, but just for one moment, stop and imagine what it's like to have 1.4 billion people sitting on your shoulders. <laughs> We've only got 26 million sitting on our shoulders. It's not easy being an Indian cricketer having to yearn to for victory for your nation um, there's a lot of people sitting on those shoulders, so they do. They they go under a lot of private stress. So I, I do feel for them. There'd be a lot of lot more pressure that yeah. way, especially because cricket. Uh, India's obviously the biggest cricket nation in the world. Yeah, that's right. It's the most followed sport in India. Yeah. It's a, a country that is literally cricket mad. Um, I can't imagine the pressure and the nerves you get. Mm being from there and having to play in their national team. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, that I, I think the, the yeah. scale, all exactly. this pressure will be from the American yeah. team because there's probably only 28 people in America who follow cricket. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so yeah. They can just yeah. do whatever Anyone, they want. Any of those uh, ones that are about to stand in front of the priest and get married and hope that the, the I do word gets used and you feel like you're very stressed, then times that by about... A hundred thousand? That's what it would feel like <laughs> in, in India when, it, when you're under a bit of stress. Just finally, just to wrap up uh, the nice chat we've, uh, we've had today, um, just going to talk about cricket as a whole around the world. Um, do you think, Gavin, that Test cricket's under threat from T20 cricket? Obviously, we've had this scenario recently where South Africa have sent a C team for a Test series in New Zealand opting to prioritise their domestic 2020 league over that test series. Do you yeah. see this as becoming a recurring theme in the next, you know, five to ten years? Uh, well, as I was saying uh, about money, 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 um, it causes major issues and it's, mm. it's on its way to do that in cricket. Um, what we're doing now is we can see so many ways of making money and just creating numerous competitions 
linking them up with marketing and sponsorship, taking the income dollars from that, then the ticket dollars, and moving on. Well, yes, I understand, like any business, um, but is sport an outright business, like, you know, the bricklayer or the truck driver, or, you know, milk, etc., etc., etc.? Is it something that needs to be uh, a product that's not over assessed? Uh, I, we don't need too much, we need the right amount. So that's why I said earlier about India, especially coming together. I think all countries need to get together with, okay, the, the primary frameworks need to be state because state feeds country and country plays country. And yes, and, and then create a defined structure, how that works every four years, and then within it, define what are the primary T20 options. And each country should have one T20 option, but you know, cut the weeks down from 10, 11, and 12 weeks, cut them down to six week pieces that work within the other parts that can, so the players can get time off, that the individual competitions, be it, say, test matches, and here's the other question, is one day internationals going to survive as 50 over games? No one's, people are unsure about that. Mm. But we've got to work it so it fits into a structure that the public's routines and life structure can fit in with it. Mm. Instead of the public surviving, working, living, being family, doing whatever they've got to do to live and survive, yeah, try and remember, where's my team, what's it doing, who's my team, what's my Who team? Who is my team? Do you, do you see any point at this stage in playing any ODI cricket outside of the World Cup? No. I, I think it's it's been deleted in the last five years. We've seen so many numbers of games being dropped. Um, I think, theoretically, um, it could be every four years for the World Cup. Like, um, T20 looks like it's going to be every two years. Mm. Um, test match cricket needs to be simplified where it's three test matches all done within just a, about three and a half to four weeks. So three test matches in a month. And you you know, you know, might do two groups, two, two nations each year, and it moves on over a four-year cycle. So but we've got to get this right because if we don't grab hold of it, we'll let it float out into the ocean and there'll be that many that we won't know who, what, when and where is playing, be it person or team. So the 50 over ODI cricket just becomes like an Olympic event so yep. once every four years I think at so. a World Cup. Because how can an individual sport have three de uh, definitions of the sport yet yeah. fit into a 365 days a year? No, it's, it's the major issue within the game because you've still got to keep the, you've got to keep the, the person as an individual and family member or friends member interested in a team to follow. Because from following a team becomes interest, becomes ticket sales, becomes membership sales, becomes merchandise sales, then marketing are interested in those people for those reasons. Yeah. So that's how the sport from a business sector that's how it survives. Yeah, I think that might be a wrap. John, yeah. thanks very much for coming in, Gavin. Cheers. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. Just some yeah. housekeeping before we wrap up. Don't yeah. forget to sign up to smartbee.com.au to get your daily tips of the day and follow at SmartBee app. We thank Gavin Robertson very much. My pleasure. Actually, thank you. You've made me feel a bit smarter today. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. So, thanks, Gavin. Thanks, John. I tend to do that to everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye, you. Thanks a lot.